Okay, we'll ask for just one more minute. I know that there's still people settling in, and they're just telling the last people outside to please make the way into the venue. Just one, 60 more seconds, then we'll be able to start. If there's any people looking for space that side, there's also seats open on this side. Okay, thank you very much. We'd like to be on time. And I think we've an allowed for enough time to settle in. If we can just ask also the um, backstage assistants to just um, communicate to especially the people at the down um, entrance um, that we will be starting soon and therefore all traffic to, um, to stop. The individuals at the door, if you can just make your way over to this side, um, our guest of honor, the minister, has arrived and it's not very kind of us to make him wait. Thank you very much.
Honorable Minister Tom Aluendo, Acting DVC for Research and Innovation and Partners, Dr. Colin Stanley, Director for Alumni NAS Foundation, Mr. Katira Kanji, His Excellency Hideaki Harada of the Embassy of Japan, I believe in absentia, and but represented. His Excellency Antonio Carlos Franca from the Embassy of Brazil, Indian High Commissioner Prashant Agrawal, uh, panelist Robert Mwanachilenga, General Manager for Reconnaissance Energy Namibia, Bridget, Mrs. Bridget Banner, Vice President and General Manager of ExxonMobil and Produ Production Namibia and Vice Chair of NEMPOA, Mrs. Nilian Mulemi, Chief Executive Officer for Petrofund, Managing Director of NAMCOR, Imano Mulunga, Mr. Imano Mulunga. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mwanyengwa Ndapewo Shali Shapwanale. I'm the Director for Communications and Stakeholder Relations for Reconnaissance Energy Namibia, the Namibian subsidiary of Recon Africa. Thank you very much for joining us for this very, very important engagement discussing the oil and gas industry in a Namibian perspective. As we let the final people settle in, we'll get right into our program as we really want to get into the gist of this conversation. Since we are in the, and we're talking about oil and gas and we're oil and gas industry, it's very important for me to do a safety briefing. We have an exit, should there be any fire, we should not. The only thing fire today has to be the conversation on oil and gas. But should there be in, in any fire, any need for us to have to vacate the venue on an urgent basis, there's an entrance or entrance and exit at the top. There's another one to my right, left, and there's another one on this side also. We have security guards also on the outside to indicate where the bathrooms are. And if there are also individuals from the NAS Foundation who will be assisting should there be any queries from the audience. I'd then like to please call on immediately for our welcoming remarks, the representatives of the NAS Vice Chancellor. Ms. Dr. Colin Stanley. Good evening. The last time we saw this auditorium one fully packed was two years or three years ago. So it's amazing to see this venue fully packed to its capacity. And I think the last time it was packed, it was something relating to food. But today you can see it's related to gas, oil and gas. So this is maybe perhaps more important than, than food. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to deliver the welcoming remarks on behalf of our Vice Chancellor of the Namibia University of Science and Technology, that is Dr. Errol Naumab, who unfortunately could not be here with us tonight. So I will read the speech as it is. Ms. Shapwanele, Director of Ceremonies, Honorable Mr. Tom Alwendo, Minister of Mines and Energy, you're welcome, Honorable. And in our midst, we also have other dignitaries. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Prasant Agraval, High Commissioner of India to Namibia. Welcome, Your Excellency. And also I had from the Director of Ceremonies, we also have other High Commissioner from Brazil. Welcome. And then Mr. Emmanuel Lunga, Managing Director of NAMCO. Ms. Bridget Werner, Vice President of Namibia Petroleum Operations Association. Mr. Robert Monashilenga, General Manager of Recon Namibia. Ms. Nelian Mulemi, 
Chief Executive Officer of Petro, Petrofund, Mr. Kaitira Kanji, Director of the Alumni and Arts Foundation, distinguished guests, staff and students, members of the me media, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening once more to you all. I'm indeed honored and privileged to welcome you all to this very important public lecture that aims to educate and inform the nation about our country's critical discovery of oil and gas. I'm reliably informed that the international crude oil price increased by approximately 45% this year alone. In short to medium term, this trend is ex expected to continue as pressure is placed on supply due to the war in Ukraine and as well as other factors. Africa may be well positioned to become a global energy production hub. Countries such as Nigeria and Angola are already significant players in this market. However, a large majority of the African countries are feeling economic pain as net importers. This has prompted some government to accelerate oil and gas exploration to be more self-sufficient. One of the biggest oil and gas discoveries on the continent was made in February this year, 2022, by Total Energies and Shell of the coast of Namibia. It is estimated that the offshore deposits could hold approximately 3 billion barrels of oil in total and provide an estimated 3.5 billion US dollars annually in realties and taxes for the Namibian government. However, as is often the case with minerals, raw materials are mined in Namibia and then exported without the opportunity to add value locally and thus do not create job opportunities and establish new industries for the benefit of the Namibian citizens. Following these oil discoveries, His Excellency President Dr. Hake Kainkop stated that, I quote, there must be some kind of value addition in the country. That is the only way you can say there will be more jobs created and money will stay in the country, unquote. Experts are quietly confident that explorations will significantly transform the country's economic future of an estimated 60% of the revenue coming back to Namibia through taxes and royalties. There is another untapped resource in connection with the oil and gas discoveries available to Namibia, and that is skilled human resources. It is in this sphere that NAST aims to contribute significantly with the establishment of a, for, of a formal oil and gas industry in Namibia. A wide variety of skills will be needed to operate and support the new industry, including engineers and technicians among others. Engineers and technicians working in the oil and gas industry typically have backgrounds in mechanical, chemical, and electrical engineering programs. NAST is already producing some of the best graduates in these fields. Internationally, several universities offer programs in petroleum engineering, including courses from the three mission programs above. This places NAS in a perfect position to offer courses and programs in petroleum engineering. Currently, petroleum engineering is offered by universities in Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa. Aspiring petroleum engineers from Namibia may therefore have to undergo training in South Africa or much further afield unless a homegrown solution to the training need to this Funding new industries found. For example, the University of Adelaide in Australia 
offers such programs under the Australian School of Petroleum and Energy Resources. In time, a similar institute may be established in Namibia. Uh, such an institute could, firstly, oversee the training and graduates in petroleum engineering. Secondly, perform world-class research in the field of petroleum engineering. And thirdly, cooperation with other internationally renowned organizations in the area worldwide. At NAST, we are well placed to assist government and industry in training, in training specialists and technicians, develop local solutions to problems, and support this new industry of cutting edge research and international cooperation. Most importantly, however, NAST may be, the instru may, may be instrumental in ensuring that more value is added locally, more job opportunities are created, and that more of the revenue of this massive windfall for the country remains in our beautiful country. I thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. We see that there are people uh, standing on that side. There are still open chairs on this side. If you can move with as little um, noise as possible. It is now my great honor to please um, request that Honorable Tom Alwendo, the Minister of Mines and Energy, please join us at the podium to deliver the opening address of this very important conversation, which is the Namibian perspective on oil and gas. Can we please give him a big round of applause? Thank you very much, um, but before I, st I, I start, I just want to make uh, something sure. I don't know if you who might know her, she used to work with Eagle FM, and I see this Eagle FM mic. <laughs> is, it, is it some sort of a, no? It's just, not at all, okay. Okay, just want to be sure. Um, just to say, I, I'm happy to be here, and I, I don't want to go through the protocol. I think she already established the protocol. Uh, I see some familiar faces here, and I'm sure the majority of the people here is probably NAST students, I, I take it. Uh, and therefore, for me, I would not really want to give um, a long speech, but rather uh, to say a few things which can actually uh, generate some discussion, which I believe uh, we learn better, I think, when we discuss uh, other than just listening to somebody speaking. So again, thank you very much for uh, NAS for inviting uh, me to come and address this gathering. Uh, and we were welcomed, except I just want to say, please tell uh, the Vice Chancellor that next time when he invites me, he not hear himself, I'm not gonna come again, so. <laughs> but I, I, I do understand he couldn't be here, but thank you for, for welcoming. Um, myself. So we are here to talk about the uh, oil, and, oil and gas, and particularly I think in terms of the fact that we just uh, announced that we have discovered, um, we have made two discoveries, uh, and as it was said, there were two discoveries that were made, one by Shell uh, and one by Total Energies. Uh, also to note that the one discovery that was made uh, by Shell it was made in partnership where um, Shell co-invested with uh, the, uh, Qatar Energies uh, and, and Namco. Uh, equally in the, in, the, uh, in the Shell one, we also got Qatar Energy and also Namco uh, being uh, co-owners of that, of that. Now, historically, um, th this has come at a time, I think, where um, exploration for fossil fuel has been happening in the country for the longest of time. 
Uh, those of you might recall, uh, you have heard about the Kudu gas. Kudu gas was discovered way back in 1974. It's a long back then. And since then, of, there has been some exploration, but uh, nothing has been found up to now that we have made these two discoveries. Uh, and I think given the fact that uh, we all know that the economy hasn't been really growing uh, to the extent I think we all wish the economy to grow. This discovery, obviously, is a good news um, that cannot be scoffed at. It's something that can really transform um, the, the economy. Also, just to say, in addition to the uh, two discoveries, uh, you also know that we do have Recon Africa that is also exploring um, um, for, for oil. Um, and I see that they are one of the sponsors of this event. So we are hopeful that they'll also soon make a discovery uh, which really propel us as an economy into some other category than what we are today. Uh, it was said, I think, uh, the, 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 the estimation for this resource, if you combine uh, between total and and, and Shell, um, the total one ranges between 200 to 300 um, million uh, barrels. Um, that's the Shell one, and the total one could range up to 2 billion. So that is not really a small discovery. Uh, so it's a huge discovery. And therefore, it's only right that after this discovery was made, a number of questions are being asked. For example, what will be the impact on the economy? Um, is it going to be, like people say, it's going to be a curse for us or it's going to be a blessing? Uh, are we going now to see uh, fuel that's going to be cheaper because now we have discovered oil? And I think those questions are really pertinent and only rightly so, you know, people are asking these questions. Uh, and therefore, what, what will that really mean for, 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 for the economy? Um, now, in terms of the, um, of the impact, of the impact on the economy. There are various impacts, I think, that can be, we can talk about. Um, obviously, we are going to get employment from the sector. Um, we are going to get royalty that's going to be paid on the revenue, which are derived from the oil. Uh, currently, our royalty rate is 5%. Uh, we are going to get um, tax on that, on that revenue, which is 35%. Uh, and also, we, there's a provision for additional tax on windfall profit that is negotiated between the government and, and the, um, the producers. So in that range already, there's really a good uh, economic impact coming to the country through the state in terms of, as I said, either because of the royalty or because of the tax, um, and that is what, what is going to come towards us. Um, now, while, while I'm talking about the, 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 the economic impact um, in terms of the, uh, of the taxes, there is also a question that is being asked to say, uh, I did say, for example, that in all these licenses, Namco has got a 10% ownership. And there always has been a question to say, but how come we only have got 10% ownership in this, in, in, in this uh, resource? Um, and therefore, people then argue that the impact is not as big because you are only having 10% through the state-owned company, which is Namco. Uh, and we need to argue for more ownership. Uh, if, if you look at it, the, you know, it, it, it sounds like, yeah, I mean, if, if you're only getting 10% out of 100, you're not getting much out of it, are you? But we, we, we need to start looking at this issue also differently. Uh, as I said, how, first, how, how do you, what, what benefit do you get when you own something uh, in terms of a company? The ownership can only reward you um, to pay you dividend from the ownership that you have got. You produce something, you, 
you get the revenue, you have got your cost, and the difference between your revenue and your cost is what is remaining as a profit. And as the owner, then you get then the dividend if there's enough profit being declared for you to get your, your profit. Now, I want us also to start looking at it this way, to say, of the revenue that the company is going to generate, how much do we get from that revenue? Before you even talk about the profit and therefore how much you get of the profit, it makes also better sense to really just look at, at the revenue that is generated before you take off all the expenditure. Now, in terms of what I've just said, in terms of the royalty, in terms of the taxes, and in terms of additional tax or additional tax you can get, the model shows that we are actually going to get up to 55% of that revenue. And on top of that 55% of the revenue, you also get your reward on your 10% should there be profit being made on that. And therefore, you do not only really get benefit from ownership, but you can also get um, um, uh, the, the, the economic impact from other sources rather than necessarily just ownership that only reward you through dividend. So I thought I'll just you know, um, uh, do that. But that is the economic impact you have got. Now, the other economic impact um, you're also going to have is through, I think it was said here, you know, value addition um, and, and other things can, you know, things that can come up simply because you do have um, oil and gas sector. And this is where the local content issues come in. In other words, how much value can be created within the economy simply because you now have discovered oil and gas? And that can come in terms of um, goods and services that has to be provided uh, to the oil industry. Now, that local content, for me, is even more impactful to the economy. If well done, you can actually get more value from, from, the, from, from this than you can get from the direct, imp, uh, direct uh, revenue that you get from, from the oil sector. For example, you can think about, um, this, this is a very highly sophisticated industry, you can think about the engineering services that must be provided to, this, to these companies. Um, you can think about the, um, um, some other uh, transportation. You can think about the catering. You can think about uh, the FSOP that need to be constructed. And, and I think, for me, that is really where the value is going to come from. The question, though, is this, that are we, as Namibians, are we ready then uh, through our entrepreneurs, are we ready to be in a position by the time those services are required? Will we be in a position actually to provide that service to the oil industry? Because it will make no sense for us to demand that um, the engineering service must be provided by Namibian companies, whereas we know very well that we don't have companies like that that are ready. And therefore, the question really we need to start to ask ourselves how do we put ourselves in a position that we are ready to provide this service when it will be required? Uh, and I'm calling on the Namibian business people to really follow this local content issue and make sure that they understand what it is, and not only understand, but also make sure that they are ready to be able to do that. Also, the value is also going to be more impactful when really the services are created within the local content or the local economy when their goods are created here. It will make no sense to simply say, oh, as long as it's provided by a Namibian company, but that Namibian company is going to import the service or the goods in any case. And that's normally what we do. We want to argue to say we are a Namibian company and therefore I want to provide the service, but you, are, you do not actually create the service yourself. Whether it's an IT service, whether it's a legal service, or whatever service you're going to provide, are you be the one actually who are providing them? Or are you simply going to buy it from somewhere else and then give it to the, local, to, to, to the oil companies? So we need to make sure that that is, we are in a position to provide those. 
And obviously, there are certain services that are much easier to provide. Um, you can think of, for example, maybe catering. Um, it's a very simple service to provide. And therefore, from day one, we should be in a position actually to provide that service. But services like engineering services, those are highly technical. Uh, and therefore, it might take some time for us to be in a position to provide that, and therefore, we may not be in a position from day one to insist that the oil companies need to source that kind of a service from our Namibian companies, but rather to allow them time to be ready. Uh, and again, it depends on what sort of processes and procedure we are going to put in place that um, our companies are going to be ready uh, during a course of time. Uh, for example, we might say, for this specific kind of uh, services, maybe from day one, there will be no requirement for local content, but maybe by year two or year three, 10% must be sourced locally, by year 10, 50% must be sourced. So it's progressive based, allowing people to be ready to provide these services. Um, so that is very, very, I think, important, and I think most of the value is going to be created through that local content um, uh, system. And also just here to say that as a ministry, we do currently have a local content policy that are what is drafted. The idea is to discuss that local content draft publicly so that we can have as much input as possible to make sure that by the time it's adopted and by the time also it becomes law, is something that we're all familiar with and therefore we have all given our inputs. So there will be a time when we actually have a public discussion how that local content is going to look like. The other issues um, being asked is that, is it going to be a case or is it going to be a blessing for us? Now, the, the short answer to that question is really just like, it depends on what we decide to do. It really all just depends on what we decide to do. Now, it can be, become a curse in two ways. It can become a, a curse economically. It can also become a curse um, in a way of socio-political issues. On the economic side, for example, it can be, become a curse if we suddenly, because we've got oil and gas, which is going to get us a lot of revenue. Somebody talked about 3.5 billion, maybe less, maybe more, but that's a lot of money. Suddenly, because we do have that revenue, we decide to neglect all the other sectors of the economy. We no longer want to do agriculture because we say, well, look, we've got money, we can always buy our food. We no longer want to do the fisheries because like, oh, fish is not really, that's, this is more money. No. We, know, we, we somehow neglect all the other sectors. Now, if you do that, obviously what's going to happen is that, you know, by the time the oil is not, it's going to be depleted, or one day, it means your economy can no longer function without having an oil sector. That's when why it can become a case such that you're really just focusing on one and you neglect all the other sectors of the economy. The other way it can actually become a case economically is that if we then were to only depend on the revenue uh, uh, coming from oil, and then we always think that oil is it's always meat. There. The revenue is there. Your budget is always inflated because you got oil. And suddenly, you can no longer actually meet the, get enough money from the oil sector simply because as we know, the oil price is very volatile. Um, as we know, we are experiencing all this today. Last year, towards the end, uh, in the last quarter of last year, the price of crude oil went down as like $20. You remember that? And suddenly now it's over 120 Now imagine if you're relying on a certain level of of a price of, of crude oil, and that's where you're pitching your budget on, and then you go on borrowing because you know you're gonna get the money, and the price just goes south. What happens? It can actually cause economic instability within the economy, and therefore, 
that is another way how it can become a curse, and therefore we need to be very careful how we, do, how we deal with it. On the socioeconomic issue, obviously, it's, and that's probably where most people think about how this can become a curse, where, for example, um, the money is stolen, um, it's put in my pocket and you guys get nothing out of it. <laughs> um, it, it can happen. Or it can happen where, uh, it happen in other countries where, because of really the, this revenue from the oil, you get too much influence from outside, external influence. And that can be destabilizing. Uh, and therefore it becomes a security issue and therefore eventually it just becomes a very, very, very difficult issue to manage. Uh, and therefore those are all issues that we have to make sure that we actually have got the processes, we have got the institutions, and make sure that our institutions that are going to manage this are very strong institutions with the people who know what they are doing, so that at least you do not have, you do not allow some of this thing to happen. Um, and therefore, the way you manage your revenue coming from this is really done in a very systematic way, such that you really manage this resource not only for this current generation, but also for the future generations. And I think in that respect of the future generation, we are also, I think, in a very good position. Um, you might have recalled when not long ago the president had launched the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and the idea was to use the Sovereign Wealth Fund to deposit some of the revenues that we get from our natural resources, so whether it's going to be in our oil and gas, whether it's going to be fisheries, or whether it's going to be minerals. So into that fund, we are going to deposit some of the, fund, of the revenue um, that will not be withdrawn. You can only withdraw the interest from that fund. But even when you withdraw that interest, it's only when it's approved by parliament. So that you don't have um, either the Minister of Energy just decide, no, I want money from this fund, or the Minister of Finance wants the money, or somebody wants the money. So you make it so difficult that, that that fund is really a sovereign wealth fund, but it's for the future generations. So I think on that, on that score, we are probably ahead of the, the curve. We are doing quite well. And also, I believe our institutions, whether it's political or otherwise, relatively, we have got strong institutions. But obviously, when you discover something like this, people do go crazy. Huh? We, we go crazy. Suddenly, I'm like, hmm. This is, so we do have the process, but we need to make sure that we continue to build on those strong institutions to make sure that we do not fail uh, to manage this resource. The other question being asked was that um, now that we have got oil, uh, we discover oil, are we now going to have cheap fuel? Is, is petrol and diesel going to be uh, cheaper because we got oil. Um, yes and no. Um, you see, having, having crude oil is not the same as having fuel. Totally different product. So you need to take the crude oil, refine it, and when you refine it, obviously you incur cost. And therefore, the price of that fuel will depend on your refining cost. Number one, on your production cost, plus your refining cost. That gives you your eventual price for fuel. Now, if it's going to be cheap, it's only because if we, yes, if we now have a refinery. If it's going to be cheap, coming from your own refinery, it's only if your refining cost and your production cost is lower than anywhere else. If it's not, there's no way it's going to get cheap. And when it's also deep water production, it's much more expensive than the people who, for example, in Saudi Arabia, where the oil is um, onshore and it's not really so much deep. And therefore, the extraction cost for that oil is much cheaper. But when you have to get it from deep water, I don't know whether you know how deep it is. I am told from the, from, the, from the water, the top of the water to the sea, to the sea um, uh, bottom, 
You're talking about 3,000, sometimes 3,000 meters. That's three kilometers. Just from the bottom to the floor, and you must still again drill another 2,000 meters, another two kilometers. So it can range between five to six kilometers to get where the oil is. Now you can imagine the production cost in that arrangement than somebody who's actually putting it on, on, on shore uh, and not so deep, probably a, a kilometer or, or, la or, or shorter than that. So in itself, just having the oil discovered here, it does not follow that it's going to have cheap fuel. It's really going to depend on what, on, on what it costs for you to refine that. Uh, but I would agree with those who say, well, it makes sense, as you're talking about the local content, it makes sense maybe to really start thinking about having the refinery. But it's not because we are going to have cheap fuel. It's just for economic development to say you have got more economic activities within the economy and therefore it makes make sense. But don't expect that the fuel that comes from that refinery necessarily is going to be cheaper because it's your crude oil. Um, the last issue I thought I'll touch on is the, um, is the issue to do with the um, uh, energy transition. As we all understand, the, clim the, 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 the climate change issues is really a, a global discussion. Um, the globe is heating up and we all need to do something about it. Um, and there's a movement then to say, let's all embrace more renewable and not do too much of the fossil fuel. In other words, let's forget about coal, for example, energy coming from coal, energy coming from oil, and just have solar and wind, for example. And I think there's no one who is against that. I think we all agree, because if we don't have a planet, even if you've got your oil, where are you going to live? So it does make sense that we should really have an energy transition. But we also say that this transition has to be a just transition. It cannot be correct for the developed country that has developed because of the very same resources we are talking about. They develop their economy to be where they are in such that it put them in a better position to also then deal with the energy transition issues. And when they are doing that, they can do it faster because they got all the revenues. Suddenly they tell you to say, no, 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 don't, look, don't use your coal or don't use your oil because it's going to affect climate. I think that's really not, not a fair way of doing things. We would understand that if it's a just transition, say, for example, the European countries, maybe what, they only need 20 or 30 years to, to transist. But we, need, we might need more like 50 because of the level of our development. For us, the most critical issues here is more really poverty of energy. We don't have energy on the African continent. For statistics purpose, 11 out of the 54 African countries, 90% of their population do not have access to electricity. They just don't have it. Uh, the whole southern sub-Saharan Africa, for example, about 1 billion people now in sub-Saharan Africa, the whole region uses less electricity per year than the 4.8 million people in Alabama in the U.S., just one state. The whole southern, you know, sub-Saharan Africa. So really for us, the most important issue here is that we need to provide energy for the, people, the people's livelihood. That is quite important. And in fact, you would also see that, for example, now that Europe is experiencing problems because they can't get the gas which they used to get from Russia. There are countries that have closed their coal plant, saying that we are going to reopen this now. Why? Because they're in a crisis. We as African countries, we are always in a perpetual crisis, and therefore I think really if it's going to be a just transition, we need to be allowed more space 
and, and have some of these resources that can help us to be ready to embrace the energy transition. Otherwise, if we are going to be told to say we need to do it at the same pace as other developed countries, I would then not really agree that that transition is really as, as a just transition. I would actually say those are really bad Samaritans who want us to do things or do not want us to do things. The very same thing which actually make to, the, to be what they are. But again, just want to add, I am not arguing to say there's no climate change issues. It's there, it's real. But all I'm saying, the pace at which we need to address this need to be different based on your level of development. And I think in that way, it's going to be a just transition. Um, I think I, I have probably said a lot. And as I said, I will probably rather want to have a discussion where people actually ask questions. And again, once again, thank you very much for inviting um, us to come and share this evening with you. And I will look forward to um, the interactions that we are going to have. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And I think it would just be fair since, Honorable, you put me on the spot there. Two things. Um, I understand that the diesel and petrol prices are going up again, and you are solely responsible for that. That's what I'm hearing. Please, if we can have a discussion outside, the minister can explain to us. And then the second thing, you said that it's cheaper to drill onshore than offshore, or at least to produce. Does that mean that each and every person here in this room must pray harder for Recon Africa than they pray for the rest? Before we call up our panelists to just engage and have uh, the conversation, um, I know that we, we just want to switch up the, the program a little bit, and I'd like to ask Ms. Bridget Vanna, the Vice President of NAMPOA, to just have uh, the presentation for us. Um, and as she makes her way to, um, to the podium, if I can just please also apologize, I'd like to recognize the Minister Councillor from the Embassy of the, of the Russian Federation in the Republic of Namibia, Dr. Mikhali, Nik, uh, Mikhail Nikitin. My sincere apologies, you are most welcome. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for this opportunity. It's, uh, absolutely wonderful to see this audience here to have this kind of dialogue on the oil and gas industry as we're going through these very exciting times. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of a presentation. I'm going to do several things. One is to uh, basically explain to you what NAMPOA is. That's our industry association for the oil and gas um, operators. I'll give you a little bit of the history of uh, oil and gas exploration in Namibia. And uh, finally, since it's a university, I thought this was a great opportunity to give a little oil and gas 101 lecture. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we, what we actually do when we're exploring and developing and producing oil and gas. <clears throat> Uh, so NAMPOA, as I mentioned, is an association of uh, oil and gas operators in Namibia. Our role is really to act as an interface uh, between the governments and uh, society in general in the industry. Currently, we have... I'm a bit too far away. Shall I just hold it? Just hold it. Apologies for that. Uh, currently, we have... 12 uh, members as part of the association. Next slide. Uh, so Namibia has a long exploration history. It started back in the uh, 1967 when the first uh, well was drilled there. In 1974, Kudu was discovered. That's the uh, gas field down in the Orange Basin. Um, there was a bit of hiatus after that for drilling. But since independence, um, 
There have been 21 exploration wells drilled up until the end of 2020. Um, important point to make here is that every one of those wells was not commercially successful. Now, this isn't uh, particularly unusual. Um, if you think to other jurisdictions in the world, in Norway, back in the 1960s, 30 wells, 34 wells were drilled before they found their first discovery. That was the Equifis field. Um, even the Western Canada Basin, uh, back in the 1940s, Imperial Oil drilled 133 exploration wells before the first oil was discovered there at Leduc. So it's not unusual to have this um, uh, lack of success when you're first coming into a frontier basin. Um, certainly, the uh, in foreign investors have invested over $30 billion since independence to drill these wells. <clears throat> Next slide. And certainly, interest in uh, Namibia has increased over the uh, past two decades. Um, there were only two exploration licenses um, back in 2004. And as of last year, there were 33 exploration licenses, both offshore and onshore. Um, so interest has been increasing over this period of time. NAMCOR has 10% um, carried interest in almost all of these licenses. Uh, some of these licenses, they actually have 15% equity. We've all uh, heard about the recent discoveries. Uh, certainly 20, 2021 and 2022 were very active years for our industry and very exciting times. Um, the Kudu field is the only gas discovery to date and they currently have plans for a gas to power development. We've all heard about the discoveries of uh, Shell and Total. Um, Certainly that's very exciting and they have plans to appraise both of those discoveries later this year to help them determine whether or not they're commercial enough to produce. And certainly Recon Africa just recently uh, spud a multi-well multi exploration program up in northern Namibia. So we're very much looking forward to seeing positive results from that as well. Next slide. So here's my uh, Geology 101 lecture, or Oil and Gas 101 lecture. I'll, I'll try to be brief and not uh, pedantic about it. What do we look for? Really what we're trying to do as geoscientists and engineers is try to understand what is down below the surface of the earth, either below the land or below the seafloor. Uh, oil is generated deep below the uh, surface of the earth, and it, as it matures, it migrates up. Um, and it gets trapped in little pockets. So what we're trying to do as explorationists is figure out where those traps are, if we have adequate seal to hold the, the fluids, if it's oil, if it's gas, if it's water, if it's good reservoir rock so that we can produce out of it. The important thing is, is that this is not easy. It's very technical, very complex, and it's well known that eight out of 10 exploration ventures fail. So it's uh, not for the faint of heart to go into this. You're more likely to fail than you are to succeed. So the first step in exploration typically is to go out and shoot seismic. Um, seismic is just essentially sending out pulses of sound, and you measure the time it takes back as it hits the different strata or layers of rock underneath the ground. You then take all of that data and put it through very complex computing algorithms and process it to create what we call our seismic sections. Then our geoscientists interpret that seismic. And again, they're looking for these things like traps and whether there might be hydrocarbons present. Uh, a seismic survey can take, you know, two to six months to complete, and the processing of that data can take anywhere from six months to well over a year. So it does take quite a bit of time. Next slide. Next slide. So you've, you've collected your seismic, you've interpreted it, you think you've found uh, something that might be prospective to drill. 
Uh, so you, you go out and you prepare to do an exploration well. Um, key thing is the only way to know whether or not you have oil and gas is you have to drill a well. That's the only way you can figure that out. Um, and it's also important to know that it's seldom the first well that you drill that tells you whether you have something economic to produce. The first well will tell you whether you have oil or gas, but you often need to drill further wells in order to be able to tell whether it's economic or not. So there's many different types of wells. There's the exploration wells that you're trying to discover if you have hydrocarbons there. There's appraisal wells. Appraisal wells can help tell you how much hydrocarbon is there, how long it might produce, and whether or not it's economic to produce. And then the production wells are once you've decided you're gonna develop the resource, these are the wells that actually produce the hydrocarbons. So, okay, so you've done your appraisal, you've figured out that, you know, you can produce this field for 20, 40 years, you've got something economic to do, um, and then you can go ahead and make a decision to actually develop the, the resource. This is where the real significant dollars come in. Um, the oil and gas industry is capital intensive on a scale like no other industry. Um, some of the discoveries down in the Orange Basin could take uh, upwards of 150 to $200 billion for that one development. So it's not for the faint of heart to get into this. And then, uh, so you're really at the final stage, you've done your development, you've invested in, in all your facilities, got them up and running, and then you can actually start creating revenue. Fields typically last 20 to 40 years. Um, so that's kind of the timeline of the revenue that you might expect to receive. So we talk about something called the petroleum or the upstream petroleum life cycle. And, and that really is what I've just described. You have your exploration drilling, you do your appraisal drilling, you decide to invest in a development, and then you come to production. A couple of key points to make about this. One is that it takes a long time to do this. It's a very complex and highly, highly technical industry. It can take uh, seven to 10 years from when you actually first start exploring until when you might actually have revenue. Second point. It's very high cost, very capital intensive. There are very few industries in the world that have this level of capital intensity that's necessary. And the third thing is it's very high risk. You are more likely to fail than succeed. So you could invest billions of dollars and at the end of the day walk away without a penny to show for it. Um, this just kind of building or amplifying on that particular point. Um, this is a cumulative cash flow, so it shows uh, both the time and the expenditure profile that you have for, for any exploration and development project. Uh, what you can see is you have a long period at the beginning of exploration where you're shooting seismic and you're drilling wells. Uh, you then discover something, you, you become much more intensive in terms of the appraisal drilling and maybe collecting additional data. And then when you make the investment decision for development, that's when your serious cash flow, uh, you're spending uh, significant amounts of money at that point in time. And so you will go for years spending money before you actually start to produce and creating revenue out of this. Slide. Um, <clears throat> the minister uh, gave us a very good discussion on uh, the benefits to Namibia from this. Uh, the petroleum agreements that Namibia has set up uh, ensures that they receive a fair share of the revenue in the forms of royalties and taxes. As the honorable minister mentioned, um, Namibia has been very clever in terms of also including a term called additional profits tax. You know, as he mentioned, um, 
you know, we're seeing on the news now about UK and, and United States complaining about the windfall profits that oil and gas companies are making. Uh, Namibia has been very clever in the way they've set up their fiscal systems that they have ensured through this additional profits tax term that they get a proportionate share of that revenue. And in total, as the minister said, just reflecting on that, um, out of this, Namibia will get 55, roughly 55 to 65 percent of the uh, profits from any production that's seen. Uh, go back, please. <clears throat> if you look at the um, cumulative cash flow uh, chart on the lower right, this is an example, a typical example for an offshore development. Um, and what you can see is uh, for each curve, if you look at the oil company share, you can see where they're spending all of the money at the beginning of this, and then when you come to production is where they start uh, making revenue. The government, however, has, um, they haven't had to invest in, they haven't had to spend one dollar to get to this point. They haven't had to incur any of the risk associated with doing this activity, and yet they get the majority of the uh, profit. So, so even though there's, um, there's this comment about Namibia only having 10%. Actually, Namibia gets the lion's share of the revenue and the profit between both the government share and, and NAMCOR share. So just to sum up, um, you know, again, the oil and gas industry is really unique. It's unlike any other industry. It's unlike the mining industry. And again, it's because of the high risk involved the capital intensity involved. And so it's very important for any government to have an enabling environment uh, to, in order for, a, for the investments to succeed. <clears throat> and so this, this is where government policies are key, um, having, having regulatory environment that's consistent and well-known, having transparency, having fiscal stability. These are things that are all very important to investors and to allow them to continue investing in the country. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, again, thank you very much. Um, uh, look forward to the discussions later on and um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Bridget. I've had the uh, honor um, and pleasure actually to to have an extensive presentation done by Bridget before. And I can say that from the time I've started in the oil and gas industry, um, it has really contributed to the knowledge I have of it now. Now for the activity I think we're all here for, um, the others were also important lead up to this. I'd like to please ask my panelists to please join me in front so that we can discuss what is the Namibian perspective on oil and gas. Honourable Minister, Mrs. Bridget Vayner, Mr. Robert Mwanachilenga, Mrs. Mulemi, Mr. Emmanuel Mulunga.
Okay. Let's get right into it. So from the brief um, presentation that we had earlier, or at least the introductions that we had earlier, we know exactly what your titles are, but if I can just ask the panelists to please just give me, in the oil and gas industry, what the roles of your organizations are and what it is that you contribute um, to the industry. Um, if I can ask um, to start with you, Mr. Emmanuel Mulunga. Upstream space is what uh, Bridget was talking about, uh, really that talks about oil and gas uh, exploration and production. While the downstream space is uh, relating to the trading and distribution of petroleum products. And so we operate in the space, so uh, you've seen uh, the various airport service stations and then the uh, national oil storage facility that we operate. So that's the downstream space. Uh, there's also what we call the midstream space which deals with the uh, refining and transportation of fuel. We don't really participate there yet, but we are an integrated oil company that operates in the upstream and the downstream. And we are basically owned by the state, 100% by the state, and we are the state's vehicle, obviously, to participate um, in this sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for I am always happy when I come to NAST. Once upon a time, it was called the Polytechnic of Namibia, and I'm a very proud alumni to be back. So if you don't know, I was very connected to NAST a long time ago, in 1996. So I can tell the same. Now, um, Petrofan. Uh, was established by the government in 1992 in anticipation for the conversation that we are currently having today, which is uh, in the event that the country discovers oil, are we going to have the human capacity to, de to deploy in the industry? So our government had the foresight to uh, establish an entity that would assist to build the necessary capacity for the oil and gas industry. Uh, the Petroleum Exploration and Production Act, uh, particularly Section 14, provides for our Honorable Minister to engage operators to make contributions to the government, to enable the government to build capacity. Our board is represented by key sectors in the industry. Uh, my colleague here on the left, uh, Mr. Lunga, Namkor, uh, serves on the board. The Minister of Education serves on the board. And my good colleague on the right here, both from the poor, uh, they also serve on the board. So it's a board that has uh, skills that um, we would require to engage in uh, discussions that will assist us to build capacity for the oil and gas industry. We have four programs that we've been running uh, since the fund was established in 1992. The program which is very well known is the undergraduate and scholarship uh, program. That program has uh, all three legs to it. The first one is a program that we manage ourselves, which has an undergraduate uh, leg as well as a postgraduate leg. We also have joint scholarships. We have a joint scholarship with NAMCO, where we are uh, assisting building internal capacity for the national we also have a joint scholarship with the Ministry of Mines and Energy, also serving the same purpose. We also had a joint scholarship with the Children's Scholarship Program, where we, as the industry, collaborate with them once we identify skills that we require 
we join the Ukraine in the Ukraine's work to go up. We recently, about four or five years ago, introduced a secondary, secondary school scholarship program where we have 20 uh, students in the program. We also have two others that I'd like to share with you tonight. Uh, they are particularly for those that have graduated with bachelor's degrees with very skilled or own in the industry. Uh, it's an offshore survival funded program. And lastly, we've got uh, an MSc Petroleum Internship funded program. Uh, these are my introductory uh, uh, words, and uh, uh, I'll share with you more information as we continue this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Mwanachideka. And I am the general manager for Nasus Energy Namibia. We are a subsidiary of a company called Nasus Africa, which is a uh, Canadian based. This is the country of stock exchange and uh, a Toronto stock exchange. We have uh, licenses in Botswana and Namibia. In recently discovered, along with the other we discovered onshore Namibia. Our license number is number 73. And uh, last year, we embarked on a really campaign of two worlds. The, if I can step back a bit, uh, we got our license in 2015 and only started uh, the building campaign in 2021 last year. As my colleague Bridget said, the oil industry is, is long. You have to start this is expensive, but uh, very rewarding to discover. So we had two of last year, uh, and we discovered oil in both the worlds, not commercial, but good oil. Proving that there is a petroleum system in the Kalambo Basin on the So we have a petroleum system there. We are quite a lot of seismic also at the same time. And uh, Sajid was explaining also, so I don't need to explain that. <laughs> so we understood the area much, much better now. And we are currently undertaking a full degree campaign, we are four rows. And we started one last week, the first one of the four. And it's very interesting. So uh, we are very excited. And uh, one other thing I would like to say uh, before I pass the microphone is that I'm very happy to see a lot of youth here, a lot of students. Because uh, our prayer is that the only that becomes uh, not the only future, but the participants highly. And you are the best to run it. You have uh, 40 years maximum of production. So if you guys want to take over this industry, then fingers crossed, I wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs> Once again, I'm Bridget Banner, um, vice chair of the Industry Association. I think I explained uh, what the role of NACOL was in our talk. I'm also, as part of my day job, uh, the general manager for Exxon Mobil. We're at the very left side of that upstream uh, petroleum cycle. Um, our technical team is currently interpreting. Uh, a seismic survey trying to figure out if we have those traps and if we have oil or gas. Thank you. I, I didn't know that you wanted me to say something also, but uh, <laughs> I think the, 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 the ministry, <clears throat> our biggest role really is to make sure that we do get investors to come and invest. That's really what it is. Uh, make sure that at least we've got the legal framework that is very really well understood. Um, make sure that you know you don't have a system where today is this, tomorrow is the other, and therefore people don't know exactly what it is you are doing. Uh, so that's really our role. And I think in that, the biggest one, of course, is the licensing. Uh, how do we license the, um, um, the, uh, the investors? What, how do they get their licenses? 
Um, our system, unlike the other countries, our system is an open license system. In other words, the whole country is actually divided into all the block. I, I, I think it was done in the early 90s. Uh, so if you look on the map, on the oil and gas map, the, actually the whole country is divided into blocks. And that's available. Anybody who wishes, anybody who thinks they've got money, um, they can actually just come and, and, and apply to us. And the law obviously says uh, for us to assess you and give you that license, at least you have to prove two things. Uh, at least you, you know what you're going to do. You must have some skills. You must have some technical skills, you know, how to do the operation and all this. You know, even if I give it to you, what are you going to do with that? Number two, you need also to show that at least you do have some money to be able to do the exploration, otherwise, again, what are you going to do with their licenses? But it's really an open system. Uh, in other countries, what they actually do, they have an option system. So, which means they take a block, maybe a couple of blocks, and then they put them on an option. Uh, and people then bid for those, for those blocks. But ours is an open licensing system. But as I said, really, ours is to make sure that we have got the uh, the conducive uh, environment in which investors can come in. And also, when they come in, now, for example, now that they have oil, we are going to make sure that they pay their due. So they're not going to get away with it. So we need to make sure that you pay the tax which you must pay, the world you must pay. We, that's our role to make sure that that happens. So it's quite a big role. So if, if we don't collect all that money, then we uh, you can't blame anybody else than the Minister of Mind, the Minister of Mind and Energy, because we must collect. Um, between the Minister of Mind and Energy and obviously uh, Treasury, Treasury, I don't want to receive all the tools that are So that's what I can say. Thank you very much. Now, when it comes to the language um, in oil and gas industry, many people say that it's quite technical and maybe a bit confusing. If we look at what uh, the minister said in his opening remarks, uh, Mrs. Vena, when you were giving us um, that presentation, there was a lot of use of exploration, uh, production. Maybe you can just tell us, um, when it comes to, what is the difference between exploration, appraisal, and production activities, if there are any? And also just how do we need to understand the different stages in which um, Namibia is at now? Uh, Mr. Mwana Chilenga, or Mr. Mulunga, if I can ask you to please just share on that. Start off with obviously exploration fees. Usually, when the minister gives us a license, um, an exploration license, which entitles you to do certain activities. And one of those activities is uh, the seismic activities that you have to undertake, which are obviously not as expensive as the one. And then you do your exploration value, which is basically taking a rig or that onshore or offshore uh, to build. Um, and while you know, several geometers in the ground uh, through the sea, if you are doing the ocean, uh, to basically determine whether there is any kind of public information in the license. Um, and then once you do that and you make a discovery that can be done, now with seven total, you, because making a discovery in itself does not give you an idea of how much oil there is. So you have to go into the next phase to replace basically what you're on. And so appraisal just means that you're appraising to find out what's the volume of the resources you have. So that's what we're currently uh, doing, that's the phase that we are in. Uh, so both our, ourselves and our partners shall in total, I think in the third quarter of this year, September, October, we'll start with the appraisal program to do you know, another five months or so basically to determine how much oil is likely to be to be lying in those license areas. And obviously once you successfully uh, do a present program, you will then you know, make a final investment decision, knowing how much that is, proving the commerciality, 
Yeah, and then you develop yeah. several development wells, from which you know which will cost you a lot of money to get the sun ready to, to produce that water. So production is really just the extraction of the oil from from the ground. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Mr. Bolonga has explained really well what uh, exploration of production is. I think just to talk to the students, uh, the oil industry is a multifaceted industry. We have got a lot of different professions, specializations in it. We've got engineers, we've got uh, different types of engineers, we've got oil engineers. Drill engineers, production engineers, chemical engineers, we got uh, accountants, geoscientists. So it's a very wide industry, and we're very happy that uh, at least we can uh, use that talent from such a wide industry just to discuss the our industry to solve our problems. Thank you. Um, I think we have. When it comes to the oil and gas exploration activities onshore, there is a lot of talk about environmental degradation from a, a proprietor. So, from a proprietor and government partner and regulatory point, how is the protection of the environment ensured? Honorable Minister? As, 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 I, said, as I said in my, um, my remarks, to say, Obviously, this, this highly technical um, environment, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that the, um, the activities to be undertaken will have an impact on the environment. There's just no doubt that. And we, um, as a government, are aware of that. And that is why, even if you look at the American Constitution, talks about the environmental management. And it's probably the few constitutions that talks about environmental. I mean, some other people... Let me use the Eagle FM one. I think it's a much better one. I think the other ones are really failing. Um, so the, 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 the Namibian constitution talks about how we need to manage, how to protect the environment. Uh, other countries don't have that. They obviously have do laws, but ours, not only do we have a management, um, environmental management act that is under the Ministry of uh, Environment to make sure that all the activities, all the drillings, there has to be, number one, there's always a permit, but that permit given to you is contingent upon you having produced an environmental management plan. Um, for example, either it's going to be because people are afraid, for example, if it's um, um, onshore, people are afraid that you are going to contaminate the water, and therefore the water drilling permit has to be given by the Ministry of Environment of, of, of Water. But that is, again, just contingent on you first having to produce that environmental management plan, which the government then will scrutinize. If we are satisfied that, yes, this is really minimize the risk, only then you actually permitted them to proceed. Um, and that is really what, what is important. Uh, but the idea to say because it's got an environmental impact and let us not do anything at all, that's what I'm saying. That's actually not really, really a just discussion. But yes, let's insist on the fact that all the companies that are doing this work, all of them, they are subjected to the high standard of environmental management and where it's found not up to standard, we simply do not actually allow them to proceed. And I think that's what we've been doing. Uh, and so far, I have to say, um, uh, we have not seen any of the companies there where they found it difficult to actually to come up with those. I think in most of all these companies, these are internationally recognized companies, and environmental management is part of what they have to do even where they come from. But obviously, we don't want to rely only because of that, but we do have our own system where they have to get a permit on every activity that they are doing to make sure that we do take care of the environment. Uh, I'm an onshore operator, and I've worked onshore 
in West Africa, Angola, and Soyo, Kabinda. I also went to one show in uh, Germany, in a field called M, in Emsland, a field called Brambeck, where we drilled onshore wells. As, as companies, all, all companies, we subscribe to international best practice in almost everything we do, if not everything. Part of the thoughts is, of course, we are drilling through aquifers, water aquifers, to get to the three kilometers down there where we find our resources. So, how do we do with the aquifer, water aquifer? For example, the minister mentioned that, or the mentioned that. We, we have uh, proven technology, which is always improving, and we design our wells so much so that there is zero possibility of any of the internal part uh, to mix with the aquifer around it. We have casing and we cement it and we pressurize it to make sure that that is what happened. And, and in, in uh, other countries where there's commercial production, we've had production for even 100 years. I went to a well in the US, 100 years producing, no problem. Uh, there are animals around, people are farming around. So we subscribe to uh, total uh, quality and best practice in the industry. And that is in almost everything that we do. We are onshore operators, so to reach to our, our drill locations, we need to construct the roads to go there. We also do everything in high standards. So um, to make the long story short, I think we there's no need for really uh, concern because the industry has proven itself that it can handle a lot of things. There are a few bad examples, yes, we know about them, but that's another story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mwana Chilenga. Just before we close it off, uh, Mr. Mulunga is a partner in all the um, exploration licenses. How do you, from a partner point of view, especially as a representative of government, make sure that the entities uh, um, ensure that there is environmental protection throughout these exploration activities? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, very good question. Um, so we, we as a national oil company, of course, is in a very unique position uh, because we are owned by the state. Um, and we obviously have to make sure that we um, you know, carry the interests of the state forward in all these exploration activities. And we ourselves uh, are a corporate citizen. We are a company, and we are a commercial company. So we we are a 10% equity holder um, in these licenses. So it is in our interest as um, as an Namibian entity to make sure that the environment is protected uh, all the time. And as the Honorable Minister is saying, Namibia is one of those few countries that has the protection of the environment. Uh, in this constitution. So, so we take that uh, seriously and, and we have, we participate obviously during the exploration activities with our partners through you know, TSA meetings and you know, uh, OCA meetings and so on. So we are very much aware of what is going on and we do give our inputs uh, when necessary just to make sure that uh, indeed the operator uh, sort of keeps to the protection of the, the environment and they work according to the environmental management plan that has been approved by the Ministry of Environment Thank you very much. I, I think the, the question is, for me, I know the, the company is all quite well aware and they got the high standards of, you know, how they also want to protect the environment. But the, we, cannot, we cannot rely on self-monitoring. Uh, Bridget would tell me, no, don't worry, we have got discovered. Uh, Robert would tell me the same, they would tell me. But it's really, as government, how do we make sure that actually people, when they give you that environmental management plan, do they really pay attention to that? Do they really live up to that? And that's our responsibility, whether it's the Minister of Mountain Energy or whether the Minister of Agriculture and Water, or whether it's the Minister of Environment, that is our responsibility. Uh, not because we don't trust them, but you know, sometimes you know, you know how <laughs> how things can go. You know, can be you know. <laughs> so it's really our responsibility as a government to make sure that the plan is really well crafted, 
and is monitored. And that is what we need to do. Uh, let's take it a bit offshore for now. Um, Ms. Ver Mrs. Werner, we know that the offshore has been around longer than the onshore. Maybe you can just give us a picture of the investment um, that has gone into offshore so far and why, I know that you alluded to that uh, previously in your presentation, why does the appetite seem to still be there um, for offshore oil and gas exploration in light of the investment that has gone into it and where we're still now at the point that we have not entered production stage yet? Um, yes, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, um, Namibia went for many decades of drilling exploration wells with absolutely no success. And as you saw, over $30 billion was spent over that period of time. So it is a very expensive uh, industry to try to uh, be successful at. Certainly, one of the um, reasons that we keep on with it is that the fundamentals of both the onshore and the offshore in terms of the geology is out there for the potential to have commercial oil and gas. And certainly uh, the results from Recon Africa, from Shell, and Total earlier this year are signs of that encouragement. Um, but probably most importantly is that energy is critical for human society's growth. Access to energy is what promotes life and, uh, and prosperity for the growing global population. Energy demand is increasing. Our population worldwide is increasing and the demand for energy is increasing. So there is a need for oil and gas to be that affordable and reliable energy source through this transition period of time. And uh, that's, that's really why we do that, to, to, um, to help promote uh, energy access for the world as well. And we can do that by balancing this, uh, the need for reducing emissions in greenhouse gas. It's not, a, it's not an either or, we can do both at the same time. Thank you very much. And I think I'll just have a follow-up question to that. Um, companies have now really started looking at in, including the um, environmental social governance into their way of doing business, especially in this industry. Can you say that in a modern day um, exploration, there should be still entities that don't have an ESG approach to business? Would you say that we can still, it, it should become a requirement for an oil and gas company or an entity in the industry to not have an ESG approach to business? If, if they don't have care and concern for the environment, then they shouldn't be in business. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're all human beings too. We all want to see our societies prosper and live safe, safe and healthy lives. We don't want to, to destroy the world, yet, per se. So uh, it's an absolute imperative for, for, finding ways to um, uh, reduce emissions and have less impact on the environment. Um, certainly, I think you're seeing over the last uh, number of years, all of the uh, major oil companies have, have, uh, have promoted efforts to find ways to decrease emissions, either through things like um, carbon capture or um, uh, you know, kind of low-carbon plastics, uh, research into biofuels and alternate energy sources. Um, so I think we can do both, and, and it's important that we all pull together to do both things. Now for, I think the, in, the students would be very interested in hearing from Ms. Mulemi, Mrs. Mulemi about this. 
the industry is quite technical and we've seen this with the language that is used, we also see with the people who operate in it. And there's always fear that the industry is parachuting or would parachute expats to, the tech, to do the technical work and then the locals are left to do some odd jobs. As Petro Fund, what is the organization doing in terms of capacitating Namibians with skills for the industry? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, I'll draw on the um, uh, uh, presentations of um, uh, Bridget and Robert as well as Mulunga uh, to some extent. Uh, the industry has three distinct stages and uh, Bridget has done a good job in highlighting those. I'll just mention them because I'm uh, interacting with uh, 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 students. Um, we have the upstream sector, the midstream sector, and lastly the downstream sector. Now, when you're trained, you respond to the sector that the industry is in. Uh, we've been made to understand that for a large part of um, our history in hydrocarbons, Namibia has really remained in the uh, 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 exploration sector. Now, within exploration, as Mulunga has explained, you also find some... Uh, uh, some uh, segments there. You first and foremost deal with exploration, then appraisal, you move to field development, and uh, you can end up into production, and lastly, after a long time, up to 40, 20 years, depending on how long we are producing, you'll be looking at commissioning. Now, Namibia has been in the, uh, uh, in the uh, exploration sector, like I said, for quite a bit of time, the skills that we have developed, developed have responded to that sector. I'm very happy today, and uh, if you might, if you just take some time to analyze the data that we have, that I can share with uh, the students that are in the uh, audience there, possibly stimulate you to take an interest in some of the skills that the industry offers. We've largely trained uh, petroleum uh, geoscientists, and among us these, we've trained exploration geophysicists, we've also trained micro geologists, we've trained oil and gas uh, GIS specialists, oil and gas data management, and oil and gas chemists. We've also trained a few petroleum engineers, and uh, amongst this crew of graduates, we have um, reservoir engineers, production engineers, marine engineers, and of late, as late as last year, we graduated subsea engineers. There's a talk a lot about the environment, and I'm pleased that the minister, the minister has highlighted that um, environment is a matter that is very key to uh, the oil and gas industry. Not only the oil and gas industry, it's all of us that live on the planet. We have to look after it. We've also trained oil and gas uh, uh, environmental managers uh, in this post to ensure that as a country we can do our own monitoring of the environment when we have uh, operations like we are currently busy. We've also trained uh, oil and gas economists, oil and gas lawyers, oil and gas accountants, oil and gas cyber security experts, as well as very important, you need to manage the oil and gas resource when you discover it. We've also trained oil and gas taxation experts that are deployed in the Ministry of Finance. Now, the question to be asked is now that we have discovered what happens next, this is a, a, a conversation that uh, I've been in the industry for a long time. I've been excited to have that conversation because it moves me from exploration to the next stage of the industry, which is a present of material development and finally some production. Now, what have we done? We recognize that as a result of the recent announcements uh, for discoveries, it's about time that we now start talking about how we should get ready to have the skills we need for the new sector of the industry. We have been consulting with our peers within the industry so that we can come up with a workforce development plan that responds to the uh, field development and hopefully production aspects of the industry. I thought I should also share with you some of the skills that we are looking at developing. Uh, these will typically skills that we develop out of our TZ uh, programs in the country. We'll be looking at skill 
groups such as oil and gas drivers, the roughnecks, very interesting names, I've asked about, we're looking at dairy men, we'll be looking at motor men, uh, uh, you uh, need to understand that the discoveries that we have are offshore. By the way, the minister mentioned about the water deal. He did not tell you how far away from land it is. It's outright it. It's more than 200 kilometers offshore Namibia. So we will need helicopter pilots. We will need uh, paramedics. We will need all sorts of skills. I'm just giving a flavor of the skills that we are going to need going forward. This is very important for us. So we are busy engaging with all key stakeholders, stakeholders so that we can get ready. Uh, this is what I can comment in terms of what we are planning for exploration and what programs we have in place to plan for the new emerging industry, which is uh, fuel development and hopefully the exciting part, which is production. Thank you very much. Let me just something on the on the skills. Um, but first, when when you ask Bridget the question to say, what why do you keep doing what you're doing? And her answer was like, oh, we we need to make sure there's the energy, which is, is human development. But she also forgot to say, also make money for the shareholders. I mean, that's the, the, <laughs> there is money to be made. That's that's. That's why we do this. I mean, that's it's, it's what it is. Um, but in the process, of uh, it's part of human development. O on the skills, you know, there's always this thing about um, us as Africans. We forever think we don't have the skills. The longest of time, if you go to Nigeria now, Nigeria have discovered oil in 1956. They'll be probably be talking about the same thing, how they don't have the skills. If you go to Angola now, they'll probably be going to tell about the, how they don't have skills. There is something fundamentally wrong the way we perceive ourselves and what we can do. Uh, Neil and talk about what Petro Fund did and all the people have trained. But we still want to argue to say we do not have the skills. I can understand how, obviously, you know, it's one thing to train at the university or, or a Tibet. It's another to do the work itself. But why, why forever are we in this perpetual thing of like, we do not have the skills? And it's not only in the oil industry. You go to any other, another, you know, even though on the IT, people will say, we don't have IT skills. I'm like, but NAS keep producing IT people. Where do they go? So I think sometimes it's also the self-belief the way we do not want to believe that my skills are good enough, and when we want to have an IT system, I rather want to go and get it from Mauritius and not actually ask somebody from who qualified from NAS and say, can you build this system for me? Really, I think we need to also change our way of thinking in terms of our own capability. I'm not undermining the fact that you need to have on the job training for you to understand, uh, but we are the one who suddenly we tell people like how we don't have the skills. Uh, and if I am Shell, obviously no, I don't want people to, to come and work on my system who don't have skills. And you have told me, you have confirmed you don't have the skills. Then I'm going to insist that, no, 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 wait a minute, I'm not going to actually use, let's, let's build the skills first. So it, it's true, we need to build that, but honestly, we do have most of the skills. Fundamentally, we do have those skills. Um, but we can retrain and, and get people to really understand what it is. Um, but if you, if you are in this mode of like, we for, always need more skills and more skill, we never actually get the skills, but the skills are there. I just want to actually make that point. And maybe just to confirm what the minister is saying, not that it needs any confirmation, Honorable. Um, I know that there are some um, Petro Fund alumni in the crowd, so if there's anybody who we have very brilliant people. If you can maybe just raise your hand or stand up, just so that you really, so that you can see that it's absolutely correct what the minister is saying in terms of we have the skills. Any petrol fund? It makes me even prouder to see that the women are outnumbering the men.
Now, before we open the floor for questions from the um, um, for, from the crowd, I just want to ask this, and this is for each and every person on the panel here. Policy, storage, value chain, and refining are some of the words being used when the question of readiness is asked. What does Namibia have to do or is doing uh, right to ensure that the country and all its citizens benefits equally from the production of natural resources, hydrocarbons um, in this instance? And also, the future of the uh, industry looks very, very bright. Is Namibia ready for production? Honorable, maybe we can start with you. D did you say the future looks bad? Right. Oh, right. Oh, OK, OK. Right. The future looks bright. I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think really for the, for the longest time, we, we, we were concerned that the, the, uh, we don't seem to have uh, good economic news in terms of where are we looking at um, in terms of you know, economic um, growth. And I think this is really a, a, an opportunity. Not only on the oil and gas, also you have followed the green hydrogen discussion. That's actually got another potential, um, really, really great potential because green hydrogen is a future energy which everybody needs. Uh, and in fact, when I was saying there's no contradiction in us embracing both, it's true. In fact, we are probably as a country going to actually reach net zero the, the fastest because we might be producing fossil fuel, but we're actually even producing more of the renewable energy. Uh, and therefore, you, we're going to actually reach the net zero very, very quick. So I think uh, what, what we really need to do, as I was saying, it's really for us to understand the potential impact on the economy. And therefore, am I ready to be able to do that? Uh, and I think by the time we actually start discussing this local content uh, uh, policy, I think that will probably highlight to people much more than what it is, and therefore to, be, to put yourself in a position where how, how to be ready. Um, because as I say, some services are very simple. It can be provided you know, you know, as soon as possible. Some are really more complex, and therefore you need to have a system. How do you then make sure that we are ready? Uh, between the uh, entrepreneurs, the business people, and us as a government, we need to find a way when, where you need to be ready over a certain time period, what, what will the government role be in that, and what will be the producer's role, which I also believe they must have a, um, a role to play, because it will be probably unfortunate when, if the operator says, oh, Yes, we like your local content, but you guys are not ready, and we can't help them to be ready either. But I hope it will be like, yes, we understand this, and therefore together we are going to make sure that we put the resources available to make sure that these people are ready actually to be able to do that. So and I think that's what I'm hoping that we will be um, hearing from the, uh, um, from the operators as we go forward. But it's very, really, very crucial to say we have a system in place how people get ready so that we have no excuse. Um, to say there are no companies um, that are going to produce. And again, I also want to, again, just again, I was saying, we also want to guard against um, uh, people who says, yeah, we're a Namibian company, and therefore we are going to give this service, but you're actually buying the service from somewhere else and not actually producing in the local economy, and therefore the impact is not really as impactful as it can be when it's produced within the local economy. But readiness, preparedness is really, I think, the key. Bridget, if I can just ask you to use the, I'm not trying to promote Eagle FM, it's the sound people are asking, if you can just use the Eagle FM mic, please. I think uh, there's two things uh, in, that are top of my mind that Namibia could be doing to preparing itself. Um, the minister in his opening comments alluded to one of these, and that is to diversify the economy. As he mentioned, uh, the government recently established a sovereign wealth fund, and that's going to be that's a, going to be very key for taking the revenue that could be generated from future production and use it to make strategic investments to help diversify the economy. Oil and gas isn't going to be around forever, and so diversification is going to be critical in order for long-term growth in Namibia. And then the second thing, and he's also alluded to this, is the local content uh, development, both workforce development and supplier development. 
And this is something that's a, a really a shared uh, responsibility, not only for, with the oil companies, but also between governments and the communities around. Um, certainly, um, you know, our company has had a lot of experience with this. You know, we had a recent discovery uh, several years ago in Guyana that, again, was very similar to Namibia. It was a frontier region. Um, with uh, no history of the oil and gas uh, production. Um, and in, in a period of six years, uh, there are now thousands of people that are directly employed by our company and by our ma major contractors. And there are thousands of local suppliers. So it can be done. That was uh, accomplished through very close cooperation with the Guyanese uh, government. And I know uh, personally that this ministry is very open and welcoming and very keen to engage on this topic. So I, I think it's something that can happen and uh, be done very well here. Uh, is Namibia ready or not? That's the question. <laughs> I think uh, we are ready. We are ready and uh, Example, manpower. We've trained more than 300 students in different skills in Petrofan. They are all around, and those can be put into, uh, of course, training, understudy somebody to take over maybe in five, ten years time from now. So I think Namibia is ready. We could have issues maybe in regards to infrastructure, but those are good problems. We can put terminals and that was good put terminals in Wabish Bay and such places for us, a refinery such things. So I think all in all Namibia is ready. Uh, I look at Namco, I'm a former Namco employee. Namco has done very well. It has expanded and really all that skill can be used in the industry. I think we're ready. Thank you very much. A very good question actually. Um, I will draw on what the minister says, that um, the success of any industry depends on the workforce, the readiness of the workforce to be deployed for the industry. And an industry as large as the oil and gas industry, the demand of, or for skills is huge and diverse. Uh, um, very happy, and uh, just to assure the minister, we haven't had an engagement for a while, I think I'll exploit this opportunity just to share some of the statistics of what we have trained. We have trained in total, and these are actual numbers, 335 graduates that are deployed in the Namibian industry at the moment. Of these graduates, 163 were provided with master's degrees. Uh, of the 163, 58 were provided with um, oil and gas specialization skills. Now, where are these people? And uh, very happy to report that uh, apart from one, all are in the country, and we know where they are exactly, each one of them, because we track them. <laughs> And I'm not joking when I say that. So if you are interested in being trained by, the, by us, just know that you are not going to run away. <laughs> now, uh, very happy to report that some of them have become very successful and they are captains of this industry at the moment. 17 of them are at Namcor. The whole department of uh, uh, exploration and production at Namcor, apart from one or two, are graduates of the Petro Fund. I'm also happy to report, Minister, that uh, the Directorate of Petroleum Affairs at, uh, at the Ministry of Mines and Energy is also capacitated by the Petro Fund. Twelve of these graduates are with the Ministry of Mines and Energy. I'm also very pleased to report that some of the team members providing legal services, I'm sure you all know Shakwa Nyambe and Incorporated, they are graduates of uh, the, the, the Petro Fund. And uh, my good friend here on my right, uh, Robert, with Recon Africa, 
has also employed some of the graduates. Some of the graduates you see uh, uh, commenting on the industry are very highly trained personnel who luckily benefited from the Petrofan programs. Where did we train them? We trained them just about everywhere. We looked for the best institutions in the world to train them. Locally, we trained most at NAST and at UNAM. Right now, we have 41 students that are currently studying at UNAM as I speak to you. We have eight at NAST, uh, we have a few at IUM, we have uh, three in South Africa, and we have six in the UK at the moment, and we've got 20 in our secondary school scholarship program. That gives us a total of 88 Namibians that are currently on the Petrofan scholarship program. Now, how's the future where I'm sitting? Very, very bright. Because um, I know that if we have trained this many Namibians and all of them are in country, we cannot get it wrong if we go beyond where the industry was, which was exploration. I can tell you that finding jobs during, during exploration is very difficult because the opportunities are limited. Exploration uh, uh, interventions are very short-lived, they've got very short cycles. So to make sure that we retained all these graduates in the country was not easy. This is where we now de uh, developed programs like the funded internship program, where we as the Petro Fund enticed employers to uh, give internship opportunities to our graduates while we paid them. And we told our interns, this is your opportunity to sell yourself. I can tell you that it works like magic. Because most of them who were given funded internship were employed at the end of their programs. But Minister, I'd like to assure you that if we've been this successful when we had no oil, uh, and this is several years of that, I implore on all young people that are here and those that are not in this room, please uh, share the information that we are going to have opportunities for training within the oil and gas industry. Uh, but I would I'd like to caution you, uh, uh, all the graduates that you are going to meet that were trained by us and many others will tell you that this industry requires a lot of discipline because it's an industry that places safety as a top priority. It's an industry that places the environment as a top priority. So if you'd like to work in the industry, just bear in mind that these would be the key attributes that we'll be looking for. So we are very excited going forward. Um, Sapan, I will make my contribution by um, trying to put these discoveries into context. Um, as Bridget was saying, they, they made some huge discoveries in a South American country called Guyana, mm -hmm. uh, more than 10 billion barrels. Um, now, there are some industry observers, observers that believe that Namibia might be in the same league, or even probably more. Uh, but obviously, those, those numbers will have to be verified by the present program that we're currently doing. Um, but yeah, we, we, when we made these discoveries in, in, um, in February, we commissioned a study by world, world uh, known um, consulting company called Wood McKenzie. And I just want to share some statistics uh, with the audience just to sort of give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, because yeah, this is no small matter, these are significant discoveries. Um, I mean, that study actually concludes that um, after years of exploration, uh, basically after 30 years of post-independence exploration, Namibia would find itself the third largest oil producer in sub-Saharan Africa within a decade. Um, <laughs> the graph and videos discoveries that we've made in oil education offshore are amongst the top 20 global discoveries in the last decade. Um, 
these discoveries will make huge contributions to our GDP. At the peak, um, about 2035 or so, they could add up to $5.6 billion. Uh, not, not Namibian dollars, because in the oil industry we don't talk about Namibian dollars, we talk about the US dollars. <laughs> so, yeah, it's going to contribute up to $5.6 billion US dollars per annum to state revenues. Okay. Um, and uh, the initial estimates after these discoveries um, show that Graf and Venus have the potential to almost double the Namibian GDP by 2040 uh, to close to 37 billion US dollars. So, so these are significant discoveries from an employment creation point of view at, at its peak uh, by 2028 20, or so. I think we should be able to employ about 3,600 additional people uh, in direct, direct jobs, indirect jobs um, as well. Um, again, we, the nice thing about Namibia is having made these discoveries now is that we, we can learn from others how they have done it um, over the past. So there are very good examples out there um, and, um, you know, oil and gas you know, production is not rocket science. So there are lessons out there how to do it and not how to do it. Um, so I think we are well placed. Um, I'm, I'm a positive person uh, um, by nature. Uh, but I believe, I think, where we are as a country, I think we, and the timing of the discoveries are, um, are good. We've got the, the institutions in place. Um, I think this is not a country where you would try and the managing director of the national oil company being a billion dollar or billionaire in US dollar terms. So those kind of things, you know, would, would not happen. So with all this income uh, and a population of 2.5 million people, um, government should be able to do a good job to make sure that its citizens actually have um, um, a good life and all these opportunities that the minister was talking about, local content, to make sure that, you know, young people like yourselves you know, you get yourself involved in the industry to make sure that you participate in the in all the myriad of, of services that will be required um, to to, uh, to make sure that the industry it takes off. I mean, I, I personally predict that um, we will spend in the next five years between 10 to 20 billion US dollars in this economy. Obviously, most of it will not be spent here because you know it will be spent on, you know, on you know, engineering works, uh, floating production uh, systems. Um, but I mean, even if you just take a you know, small percentage of, say, five percent or ten percent of that money remaining in the country, it's quite significant. So there's a lot of hope. Um, I think some of us started in the oil industry. I think personally started off 27 years ago when I was maybe some of your age. So um, it's not too late to start. Uh, it's a great opportunity that obviously the, the country has, has provided. So yeah, you should, you should take up the challenge and make sure that you participate. Uh. Thank you very much. With each panelist's contribution, just do that, because it's really the question that everybody wants to know. Are we ready? Are we doing the right thing? Are we preparing ourselves to make sure that once we, uh, Recon Africa finds where the oil is, oops, I mean, sorry, once we find where the oil is, anybody, not just Recon, <laughs> then we are in the right, we are placing ourselves correctly to make sure that each and every Namibian benefits from this uh, natural resource that belongs to us. I think we'll now take um, questions in three phases. We are about eight minutes behind schedule. Uh, so we'll take questions in three phases. If I can just ask, um, okay, Marin Kakero, if you can help us. We'll have questions from this side. I've already identified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven individuals.
if we can just uh, keep our questions or comments um, short, but we'd really prefer that questions because this is the only, not the only time, but there's not always that you get every single person contributing to the industry all in one room that you're able to get responses from them. So if we can get the questions just briefly, um, ma'am, um, and then Ogeto. And then can we just have those hands raised again so that we can identify the gentleman with the... Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. And um, yes, I Okay, yeah, this one is much better. Um, no, I would like to appreciate the panelists and uh, NAS um, for organizing an event of this nature, as there are not much, we got to learn a lot. Um, just shortly, my question is an uncomfortable one. Um, my father raised me to have, to sometimes have the uncomfortable questions because we have to deal with certain things. Now, we have a... We have an ill, we have a, an, we have an, some evil looming amongst us, something that we do not desire at all, but unfortunately that is a reality in our country, and that is the question of tribalism. My question is derived from um, the, a problem that uh, was um, as a cause of all discovery in the Niger Delta, uh, where we have the Igoni and the Ijo tribes that have been uh, battling with the government of Nigeria um, as the, their areas of ancestry or their ancestral land where uh, oil was discovered on that land. And they have, seen to, they have seen, found themselves in the position of being exploited and not being rewarded as this um, discovery was within their land. Now, when we're talking about the uh, area of discovery uh, within the south or even within the Kavango um, uh, uh, areas, should oil uh, be discovered there, um, has the ministry or the government in general perhaps looked into rewarding, even if it is just the traditional communities within those areas or give them some sort of preference uh, um, given that oil is discovered within the area, so we do not have uh, um, the, the, the case of the Niger Delta that eventually resulted in the militarization uh, of these areas because of the uprising of those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask that we thank you very much for your contribution, that we please keep our contributions or questions as brief as possible so that we are able to, um, to accommodate as many people as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is I'm a journalist. I work for Republic Game and Namibia Media Holdings. Firstly, to Mr. Malunga, I'd like you to elaborate for us about the progress you've made in terms of downstream and how far you have progressed towards reclaiming your right to import half of the fuel into Namibia. Then I'd like to ask uh, the lady from Petro Fund. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. But my questions are just about the sources of income for the fund and the current strength of the fund. Thank you very much. I'd also like to ask the gentleman from this one about, uh, that would be Mr. Robert Mwana Chilenga, about how you have treated farmers in the Kavango where you've already drilled your exploration holes, where court cases are pending and considering that these farmers are not the most uh, financially uh, well-off people. Those court cases are being led by the LAC, which is a Namibian institution which defends people who cannot defend themselves. Is that not an indication of what you think of Namibians in general and how you will treat us in the future? Also, I'd like to ask you about the distance uh, that you would have to extract to move that oil if you do find it and the environment you'd have to move it through and what you would do to preserve that natural heritage, which should last us even after you are done. Then I'd like to ask Ms. Verna about her role at ExxonMobil 
And if you could elaborate about what that co company has done in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of renewable energy and moving away from fossil fuels. And finally, I'd like to ask Minister Tom Alwendo. Namibia has always been a rich country full of poor people. What makes you think that more money will mean a better life for most of us? Thank you very much. I think we can take... Um, do we want to respond to that or take one more? We can respond to this. Okay. Uh, uh, Ghetto, I, I don't know that, that clap of hand whether it's because the question was relevant or because <laughs> or because the question was let's see what he's going to say. <laughs> okay. You know, when I said is this going to be a curse or a blessing? I said, I said the question is, it decides what we do. It's really, it's all what it is. If we are going to steal the money from this, obviously we're going to have problems. If we are going to misappropriate, it's going to have problems. And that's what I'm saying. Let's just make sure we build all the institutions that we need to have and make sure that the money doesn't disappear. It goes to, it goes to, it really goes to where it is, where it's supposed to go, and where is that? Is the treasury to make sure that we build the infrastructure, we build our education, we build our health system, because we now do have the money. So it's really, uh, maybe not as simple, but really it's, it's, it's what we decide to do with it. Uh, and I also did say, what you really need to have is strong institutions, how to manage this, and we have clear, transparent way of everybody knows exactly how much revenue did you get from the, from the oil sector and how was it used. And if you got that process, obviously we all then agree to say, well, you said you got so much money and you only used it, what happened to the rest? So if we have got that transparent system, I don't see why we should not really benefit from that. And that's is for you to demand the transparency. Just demand it to say, we want to make sure there's a transparent system and therefore there's nobody who's going to have some deals outside of the system. On the, uh, on the, um, the, the first question, uh, let me also just answer while I have this, on the, um, on the Ogoni tribe in Nigeria where the, uh, you say um, uh, tribalism in, in maybe ethnicities, I, I sometimes think we are losing the one, one Namibia, one nation. I think we are losing that, really. In our discussion, when you look at social media, it's almost like, yeah, because you are from that tribe, and you are the tribe, and therefore that's what's happening. So we are losing that. Uh, but the, the, the exact example you gave of, of Nigeria, I'm not so sure whether it's tribalism necessarily. Uh, it wasn't like, oh, because you are that tribe and therefore that's what's happening. It was simply, the, the, it's true, the regions where the oil is being produced, people, they feel like they are still underdeveloped, whereas you've got some other part of the country which is developed. Uh, and again, the very same answer I'm, I'm giving, if you got a transparent system whereby the money that is derived from this goes to the central budget where everybody gets their pie. I'm, I'm not going to agree to say where the oil is found, they must get more because there's where it's found. I don't think I want to subscribe to that. We must just share equally where the resource is and therefore we develop the country as a whole, not to say it comes from here or it comes from there. Uh, and in any case, in our case, uh, if it's the one in the waters, I hear people in the south say, oh, it's in the Karas region. No, it's not in the Karas region. It's in the water. It's 250 kilometers from Oranyamund. Way from Karas region. It's not from the Karas region. But that's not really the most important thing. We need to have the resource is manage that is develop the country in its totality. Obviously, the areas that are more underdeveloped, they should get more of it. 
because they are underdeveloped. There are areas that are more already developed, they get, should get less of it. So it cannot be where it comes from. It's really just you look at the total of the country, how do we want to develop, where are the opportunities, and that's what we're going to be doing. And as I say, for you is to demand transparency in the system to make sure that we know why, why are we doing that and not this, because there's transparency in the system. Uh, no. No, no, can we just ask Mr. Mulunga to respond to the question just so that we can finish the cycle? Because there are questions directed to the panelist. You will be given an opportunity, sir. Excuse me? Okay, okay Mr. Mulunga? Hello, okay, yeah, it's, it's working. Yeah, I um, just want to, to take the opportunity to respond to the question of uh, Ghetto uh, before, before I forget. Um, thank you very much for... ...the question. Uh, you were basically inquiring about uh, how far I'm going to respect this transfer uh, strategy, service stations, and, and the 50% mandate. So, yeah, so we've been very aggressive with uh, our downstream strategy. Uh, we, we decided three years ago already to go into the service station sector because we realized that the margins, the profit margins there are much, much better than the traditional B2B business that we've been uh, doing. Um, so we, we went out on an aggressive um, service station building campaign three years ago. Currently we have 11 service stations that are operating on the Namco brand and we have uh, our 10 service stations that are on our books at various, uh, various stages of construction. So by this time next year we believe we'll have around 20 service stations that are operating and our desire is to have about 33 service stations by 2024. Uh, and we're fortunate enough to, to be rolling out these service stations our own balance sheet. Um, I think we've become so strong in the past, obviously, and people thought uh, that we will not be able to do it uh, on our own. Hopefully, we, we can get to that number, uh, but obviously, the minister has to give us those uh, licenses, the retail licenses, for us to get to that number. Uh, but we are confident that uh, we can still find a niche in the market to be able to serve the customers with. with uh, very good service stations with the local brand. Um, as far as the 50% the, uh, mandate is concerned, um, yeah, I mean, you very well know that this mandate was revoked in 2010, 2010 uh, when we experienced problems with our last uh, supply of fuel. Um, and so after that, uh, two years ago, we went back to the government basically to explain to them that we are now ready to resume this mandate to import 50% uh, of the country's requirements. Um, and the government gave us obviously the support and the approval. However, in the intervening time, there was the competition commission that came into existence and that we had to also to go to them to basically ask whether this is, this is possible, whether they can allow us to basically import the, the country's 50% fuel requirements. Um, but they found that to be anti-competitive, so we did not succeed. Um, so, uh, you know, we said it's fine. Um, Namibia currently sort of consumes about 100 million liters per month, right? So we told ourselves no problem. We, we will not, you know, fight with the competition commission. Believe in our own strengths, in our own capacity, and we said we would rather want to compete fairly in the market. Uh, we believe that at some point we will be able to import that amount of 50 million liters per month without having a mandate. You know, and um, you know, about five years ago we used to import about seven million liters per month, um, but. 
Last month, we managed to import, we had not only import, but we managed to serve 50 billion liters of fuel per month, which in regard to your calculations, it's more or less 50% of the sure. country's requirements. So we managed to do that without a mandate. So we keep on growing, um, and we believe that yeah, we should, we should uh, rather grow like that instead of having to you know, get you know, mandates from government to, to import. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will turn for the two questions. Uh, one was the sources of the income of the petrol fund, and the second one, the strength of the fund. The sources of the income. Every company granted a license to explore for hydrocarbons, negotiates with the government to make a contribution that enables the government to build capacity. Currently, there are 34 on our books petroleum exploration license holders, and each of those have a negotiated amount that they remit directly to the petrol fund. So that constitutes our source of income. In terms of strength, um, the Board of Trustees of the petrol fund adopted an income management policy ever since the fund was established which requires us as the managers of the, uh, the organization to uh, invest all the funds that we receive and only use the interest portion to um, deploy towards our skills development. That policy has served us very well, which has left the fund fairly strong and be able to uh, meet its mandate. Of course, when you are in the investment sector, it's another conversation that I can spend some time on. You are subject to market conditions because your interest depends on how the market behaves. And uh, you will agree with me that the last two years, the financial markets were very poor as a, as a result of COVID. You're pushing me to introduce that conversation, so I'll comment on it very briefly. So what we have done as, as the board is that um, the contributions that we receive in a financial year, for example, this year, should we have a shortfall in income, a certain percentage of what is contributed is remitted to our training fund. That enables us to continue training at the same pace that we would have budgeted as a trust fund. I hope I've answered your two questions. I'm not. Thank you. Um, let's not engage in, I think you can ask questions afterwards, maybe follow up, just to avoid in, um, dialogue. Um, Mr. Mona Chilenga. Operates on the ESG level. That's what that's what we do business. E being the environment, there's the social part, the engineering governance part. Yeah, you talked about the farmers. The farmers with uh, their concerns and the court cases. First of all, I must say that the farmers are in the region are some of our most important stakeholders, and we have been uh, engaging them all time. Uh, obviously, farmers are farmers. And anybody else, if you come to your yard, so, and I start drilling in your yard, you'll be concerned, of course. And then you have questions. And these things have been raised, and everything is fine. We had meetings last last week, and we all went to work. Last, the last two weeks, all everything went to work. With regards to luck in cases pending in the court, I'm sorry, those are. I cannot mention anything of them. Uh, let, let, let's let it pass until the court cases are done. You also uh, asked an uh, important question about how we're going to move away uh, the gas in the environment. Uh, we are at this stage in uh, drilling, so we, we need to find out what product we have there first. And then from the, the main product, and then we develop a development, a development plan for that uh, product, how to evacuate, be it crude oil or be it uh, natural gas. Okay.
Thank you very much. Uh, Bridget? around the world, and we're also working with um, other companies to help them with the reduction of their emissions. We're also trying to figure out ways to take the carbon out of hydrocarbons and how to capture the carbon out of the atmosphere. One of these uh, techniques is called cap carbon capture and storage. Um, this is a technology that ExxonMobil has employed in several fields in North America for the last number of decades. It basically involves capturing the CO2 emissions and then re-injecting them down deep below the surface of the Earth. That's called carbon capture. Um, recently, ExxonMobil announced two major projects, one in the Gulf of Mexico and one in Rotterdam, working with all the industries around there to capture their carbon and uh, store it uh, safely. We're also spending billions of dollars a year in research figuring out how to take carbon out of the hydrocarbon. Um, certainly the minister has talked about uh, green hydrogen as being an effort or initiative that you're embarking on in Namibia. One of the research elements that ExxonMobil is doing is something called blue hydrogen. Is where you take the carbon out of the hydrocarbon chain and use that remaining hydrogen to generate electricity. We're also spending uh, research dollars on developing biofuels, uh, things like lightweight plastics or no carbon plastics. So a significant amount of effort is being put into to evolving our business to the new reality that's going to be happening over the coming decades. Thank you, Bridget. Um, the gentleman indicated, then there was, I want to be fair. And can I also just ask, please, um, it, it's, this is a, we would want to give everybody an opportunity. So can we please ask one question per person and not five questions, because then we are taking an opportunity away from the rest of the audience to ask questions. Okay, the gentleman there. Uh, let me just start with uh, uh, the issue whether the farmer uh, in Kalango, I'm coming from Kalango, I think Bonakilenga, don't say that the farmer uh, in support. They even express on the 18th of June that they, are, they express their discontent the way you are conducting your activity in Kalango region. You would disregard them that if they are not human beings. That is what they express because the government and Dragon Africa has put even the farmers, like the people are put on the car, on, on the gun point, where they cannot, if they have all, all, only to say yes or no, otherwise they will be shot. That is how, how, how you are conducting your activity in Kavango. Let me just say. Uh, coming to the question, uh, the issue here is the government and Dragon Africa, and the government, especially the Ministry of Mines and Energy, choose the life of people of Kavango over money. That is really, uh, to me, I can just say that it's very much uh, irresponsible government that choose life of people over money without considering the life. Because when the minister talked, he only talked of the impact on the economy. He, he did not even mention any, the, how it will impact the livelihood of the people. 
And after destruction of the, the, their farming land, then the people of Karang will have to live on, hand down and hand out, and then later you will say those people are poor, those people are lazy. Coming to water contamination, you mentioned that you have to care casing that will prevent from contamination of the leakage. You want to say that whether it ends, will you put also that it will not uh, that the open the, the well itself? Why will um, abstract the oil and gas? How will you, you, you cover that uh, while it ends there at the bottom there? It's impossible to say that uh, it will be prevented. That is not true. And uh, when we talk of uh, um, the wells, that will go more than uh, 3,000 deep, meter deep. Now, the boreholes will dry up and who will be responsible for that one? That one is obviously the boreholes will dry up. And who is responsible for that? And say to say that the, the, the government or whoever or the people are ready with, with the exploration of breaking up the oil and gas. But I heard from the, the welcoming remark that the national people of are trying to accommodate causes in, meaning they not yet, the causes are not yet offered. And uh, when we tell people the consultation, it was this regard from the beginning that people of Kalang were not even consulted, they were the communities. Because they only see, even when you are invading the farm, you see people just see people coming in, in, in their farm without even proper prayer consultation. How does it, how do you say that uh, people are consulted? When you put people at the gun point? <laughs> yes, and then uh, when we talk of a strong institution that, uh, that monitors, I think it's what mentioned by the Minister of Mines. I think that uh, people have raised, and even we also even present and, and uh, submit our objections, and uh, even highlighting how Western Africa violated even the, the very institutions, legislations of Namibia. But it has been put just in the damp air. We have to uh, submit our objections and we have even highlighted what they have violated. The environmental laws, the land reform act laws, and all the, all the, 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 the policy which come of the Namibian. It's by being violated, we highlighted it, but the government just put the damp air. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there was a gentleman Yes, the gentleman with the shades on the head. Then there was... Uh, okay. The, let's just identify and then so that the mic can move on. The gentleman, the lady uh, who, who's holding the mic, the gentleman with the um, sunglasses at the back, and then the gentleman with the reflector um, jacket. My apologies for pointing. And then the young lady here with the shades. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I think the Recon Africa case is a really good example of how <coughs> Namibian people are going to be treated throughout uh, you know, the, invest, the investment opportunities that we get. Uh, at the end of the day, we are the ones that will be losing out. I mean, what worries me the most is what uh, Bridget said about uh, in order to find successful uh, um, wells, you would have to drill about 34, up to 34 wells. I'm just wondering, Recon is exploring onshore in both Kavango East and West region. So um, we have already had issues whereby Recon Africa has confiscated people from the access of land illegally and also doing seismic surveys through people's Mahango fields and never compensated any of those people for anything. So now I'm wondering, uh, um, this is going to be a large scale you know, destruction of people's lives and livelihoods. What, what are we, you know, how are we going to ensure that the, the people, uh, together with the oil exploration that's going to take place, or that or that's already taking place, that they live, uh, you know, hand in hand and nobody loses out and nobody, because we are looking at people having to leave that area, lots of people having to leave that area and move into urban areas, uh, in squatter camps, which we, at the end of the day, cannot really maintain. And I just don't understand why uh, our government decided to sign the Paris Agreement if we were unhappy with uh, the terms that were in the agreement. And then at the end of the day, turn around and do exactly the opposite. I mean, how do you justify that? I thought that it would be good for us to stick to all these agreements because 
we are the hotspot of global warming. The global warming will bring with it a, a, a drought, and Namibia is the driest country in sub-Saharan Africa. So we are in the middle of of the global warming crisis. I don't understand why we are not making sure that we don't, you know, uh, participate or, or contribute to, to global warming by investing in, in in the gas and oil industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have the gentleman, since we are on this side, just finish the gentleman with the reflector, then we can take it up to the gentleman with the sunglasses. Uh, evening, okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Okay, my name is Christopher Uh I have been involved in the oil and gas industry, drilling offshore, inshore, onshore, with Recon Africa project and all over. Uh, I just have a suggestion of trying to help our two institutions, the Polytechnic of Namibia and uh, University of Arts, uh, UNAM. Yes, 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 we produce very... <laughs> sorry, last <laughs> and... Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm a vocational trained person. But anyway... Okay, let's keep it short. Uh, University of uh, uh, UNAM and, and, and then NAS. We have a problem when, 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 when these guys graduate, the problem is that the guys cannot move hands. The guys that don't even know the basic hand tools. So, this is... No, 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 I, I'm going to come there. So, you find, you find an engineer... You find an engineer from Polytechnic, wherever he's from, from, from Lou, from, 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 from Germany, from Sweden. Then you take our engineers, then you find that but this guy can do more practical. Why is this guy cannot do this practical way? What is actually going on? So, what my suggestion is that the help is that we should put these guys to work. Because if you want to enter the whole industry, it's not going to be these things of you sitting in the, in the computer. You have to be the practical <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can we have the last comment from the gentleman with the sunglasses, just to give our panel an opportunity to respond? Master, Director of Ceremony, Director of Ceremony, Minister Reno, the panelist, I would like to say a protocol of said. In Namibia, both our leadership, the traditional leadership, the political leadership and the corporate leaders, we have got a trust issue. What, what assurance do you give us that we should trust you this time around? <laughs> I want to plead with our minister, Arendo, when you are answering us, please, don't be political. Yes. As an idiot, let's hit the jackpot. <laughs> what assurance do you give us that record Africa or this uh, Companies that are coming to explore in Namibia, to invest in Namibia, they are not going to, they are not going to, uh, to, to exploit Namibians. As we are seeing, our brothers are in jail today because they were trying to protect Namibians from the Chinese explo exploitation. Give us an assurance. Let us all be on the same page. Uh, the minister said. When the, the, the national cake is being shared, it has been shared equally. I want to know how many people from the Kafango region has benefited into this into the the, 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 the bursaries that you are offering. I come next to the town and the town council when they have taken our land, we remain poor. We are squatters in our in, in, in our own country. Please give us an assurance. We also need to benefit equally like everyone else. Because we are seeing few people are becoming overnight pioneers, politicians. People who are, who are being employed today, we definitely need an assurance. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this is going to be a case. Thank you very much. Um, can we ask the panelists, just so that we don't lose the train of, of questioning, can we ask the panelists to just uh, um, respond to that? And the lady, the lady here with the side glasses, right here, second line. Hi. 
Okay, I just have one question. With Namibia being water insecure, in the process of drilling requiring a lot of water, a large amount of water, how do you plan on ensuring that Namibia does not dry out? Mm. Thank you. So, um, I'm pointing it to, to Miss Bridget um, Benna. Thank you very much. Okay, let, let's, uh, let me try and, and, and answer some of the things. Two principal issues. Two principal issues with regard to the issue of Recon Africa doing the wrong things. The only thing I want, again, just to reiterate is this. We do have, we do have a, an environmental management act that has to be followed. If the argument is that the Recon Africa did something wrong and they didn't follow the law, the issue is not then with Recon Africa. If then for government people who have approved it. But I have been assured if it's about the, 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 the water permit, the water permit has been by, given by the ministry that is responsible for the water permit. Are we now trying to say they are not um, good enough and therefore they are not, they don't know what they did, they just simply did that? Who, who, you want to say you are the specialist, you know more than what the specialist people who have done and say that's what it is? So that's a principle to say yes, there is a process that has to be followed rigorously. And if they haven't followed that, then at least now like, let's, let's, let's investigate that. So how, how did they get to do that? The other principle is this, with regard to the farmers, again, the principle says Recon Africa has to consult with the farmers and have an agreement. If you say that agreement wasn't reached and, and they simply went on somebody's farm, I guess that's why they are probably in the courts and probably the court will then pronounce itself. There is a process of discussion to agree. If you are saying somebody was taken from their land without compensation, again, that is not what the principle is supposed to be. If you are going to replace somebody from their land which they use, then obviously there must be compensation. That's what it is. And really, that's all what I want to say. With regard to the, uh, in, uh, why we are doing this, I have already explained myself. I am more concerned about the livelihood of the Namibians I'm more concerned about the fact that we don't have energy, while at the same time, we are producing renewable energy that actually will be a zero net, net zero position which we are going to be in. And with regard us facing out this, I want to be given a chance to do that at a much more slower pace than other people because they have already reached where we need to reach. If they didn't, they weren't going to insist on this. They weren't going to do that. Why do you think Germany suddenly says we want to reopen our coal plant? Why? Simply because they find themselves in a situation where it's unbearable. And for me, our livelihood of our people are more unbearable. While I'm aware of the climate change, I need to exploit this resource to make sure that I put the people in the position to be able to deal with the transition issues. That's, that's really my, my position, that's the government's position. To say it's not a contradiction, it's something that is much more urgent, and mind you, the climate change people are arguing about. Africa contributes less than 2% to that problem. It's the developed countries that actually have polluted their things. Because we suffer this floods or the drought, it's not because the pollution was in Namibia. It's because the pollution was everywhere in Europe and America. It's in the atmosphere. So now for you to argue honestly to say, let's leave that resource and therefore let's quickly embrace the renewable, I think you're really doing yourself a disservice. But I do agree that we have to do with the due care in terms of how we manage this environment. And I also agree to say, let's make sure that the resource that we are going to get, the revenue that we're going to get, is going to be used for what is meant to be used. The transparency issue I was talking about. 
That's, I think, where we have to have a conversation. And the gentleman said, give me your assurance about the, we as whether as political leaders or corporate leaders or um, traditional leaders. I want to read something to you, which just an answer. There's somebody who wrote to say, when you choose your leaders, choose your leaders with wisdom and forethought. Because we all choose our leaders, right? Except traditional leaders, maybe it's just a session. It's not, it's not. But it says, we choose your leaders with wisdom and forethought. And they says, to be led by a coward is to be controlled by all that the coward fears. To be led by a fool is to be led by the opportunist who control the fool. To be led by a thief is to offer up your most precious treasures to be stolen. To be led by a liar is to ask to be told lies. To be led by a tyrant is to sell yourself and those you love into slavery. So just let me make sure that you make sure that what, what we need to do, we've got the right people to, to do what needs to be done. Uh, but to honestly say, let's not do this because we are fear is going to be a curse, we have already given up. Let's not give up. Let's insist that this thing must be done in a very transparent manner to make sure that the resource goes to where it's supposed to go. And I think really that's what we should start to think. And it should not be a, a curse at all. It should be a blessing for all of us. But those are some of the things that we need to start actually doing and think about how we can do that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are running out. We actually way beyond our time. Um, so to the panelists, as we just conclude with these responses, can I also just ask that we are very brief. Honorable Minister, thank you very much for that. Um, do I need to maybe remind of the question? Oh, we are fine with the questions. Okay. Um, the water issue. The young lady asked, how do we make sure that the, bore, um, that the water doesn't dry up? Can we just Bridget, yes, please. Right. Um, so, in exploration operations, um, you use water for drilling your well. It's part of the drilling well. Um, in my experience, um, you typically use maybe one to two swimming pool sizes of water for drilling one particular well. Um, and often you recycle that drilling mud for the next well operation. So you, you don't throw that drilling mud away. You save it, you store it, and you reuse it. So, so the water usage in actual drilling is um, not a huge percentage of what the needs of the local population are for, for water supply. Uh, the other aspect of um, uh, oil and gas operations that uses water is something that's called fracking. Um, now, I'm not aware of that. That is is done when you have a, what's called an unconventional resource, so it's a really tight reservoir. Um, I'm not aware that that is anything that is being explored for in Namibia. Certainly in the offshore, there's no economics at all to do fracking in offshore wells. So that, that that's something that will never happen. I can guarantee that. On the onshore is where you tend to find unconventionals. But as far as my knowledge of the geology of the Kavango region, there's there's um, there doesn't appear to be that type of resource there. It's the more conventional where you don't do fracking or you don't need to do fracking. Okay, Mr. Manachilenga, briefly, please. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, just as a point, Honorable Minister, thank you very much for such a forum. Because uh, I think it's good that our people understand what's happening. And they are coming with genuine questions. I mean, it's from their genuine hearts, which is very good. However, my experience in the Kavango region and the time I've worked for Recon there, I've seen that uh, it was really lack of proper information about what drilling is. We're a mining country, and mining is well known. 
but oil and gas is not so well known. And given the understanding of about a year ago, and what the people now think is day and night, people had an idea of you know wrong things. We have communicated with them, we have spoken with them. They now understand. And not to make a long story short, not to make it uh, too long. If if we can, uh, okay, water, water is she has greatly explained. That's not a problem. And and. There is a ceiling of water of the aquifers. We're going three kilometers down. So whatever we find in the middle, we seal it, completely sealed. Uh, if, if we are going to be producing, if our neighbors produce oil and gas very close to us, Angola, onshore, Kwanzaa, if the Mozambicans produce oil and gas, then uh, Temane and Pande field, for 30 years they've been producing. Why should we, be, why should we fail in Namibia? I think we should look into it in that aspect. The technology is there, and everything is good enough for drilling and production in this country. And uh, I don't see any issue, honestly. And I, I beg to, uh, to differ in most of these points, but it's good that you raise them so that we can try to educate and talk together. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Monachilanga, if I can just, um, this, the, there was a question about how many students have benefited um, from um, uh, yeah, in Kavango, specifically the two Kavango regions, um, from Petro Fund. Okay. Uh, and any additional, if there is. <laughs> right. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just um, I'll comment on it. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Monashilenga is right that Recon Africa has offered 10 scholarships to candidates that are coming from the Kavango East and the Kavango West region. Uh, this um, commitment to fund this, uh, these students is for until they complete their studies. And uh, the funding commitment is 1.2 million Namibian dollars every year. And they have, we have entered into a partnership with Recon Africa where Petrofund manages the Recon Africa Scholarship Program. So over and above, the number of students that I've mentioned that are on this Petrofund Scholarship Program, that are 88 this year, uh, another 10 uh, is funded by Recon Africa. So there are a total of, if you like, 98 students that are funded by the oil and gas industry in Namibia at the moment. So the 10 students are currently at the University of Namibia as well as uh, at NAS, and they are fully funded by Recon Africa. Now, this is over and above the obligations that they already have because according to the Petroleum uh, Act, they are still required to make a contribution to the petrol fund. So they make the contribution to the petrol fund over and above they also have set up uh, a scholarship program dedicated for candidates coming from the two regions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as you know, this, is, this was just the launch of a monthly conversation. We only had the minister until 8 o'clock, and they, I am under... I'll be in trouble with the office. I, in fact, I think I'm already in trouble with the office to keep it, for keeping him way beyond. If I can just ask the panelists, please to briefly close this off for us before we call Mr. Katire, Mr. Kanji to give the vote of thanks to us. Again, it's a conversation that can not end in one night. Hence, the discussion having to be monthly. It's a conversation that we continuously have to have because it's a continuous educational conversation. The more you ask questions, the more I ask questions, the more responses there are, the more we learn. And I speak of myself also as a Namibian citizen. So panelists, please, in 30 seconds, can we just have your closing remarks before we ask for a vote of thanks? I'll start with you, Mr. Mulunga. Thank you very much, uh, Shafanale. Yeah, um, I just want to again thank the organizers of, of this event um, for facilitating these kind of conversations. Because it's through these conversations that we start understanding the oil industry, the impact of the oil industry to our economy, to our uh, various regions as well. So I think from Namkorsha, we will continue to participate. 
and to engage with, with everybody uh, to make sure that we are on the same wavelength. Because what I'm guess is, is, is a big thing, these discoveries that have been made are big. Um, Recon Africa is doing a great job onshore drilling forwards. Uh, not only drilling forwards, I mean they've done a lot in terms of drilling waterworks as well. Uh, 22 waterworks, uh, so, so that's not a, a small matter. So I think we should, uh, as Namibians, also be appreciative of some of these efforts. Not only that, I'm sure there's a lot of people from the Kavango regions that have been employed. And I don't know, Robert, how many people? More than 500 people that, that have received the employment. So this would not, not have been possible if there was no oil and gas exploration in the Kavango region. Um, so I think let's continue the engagements and the conversations. Um, oil and gas is going to have a positive impact on Namibia, no doubt. And I think it, we will decide as a minister saying we will have to make the decision whether it's going to be positive or a negative uh, impact on the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the platform once again. Uh, I'd like to echo of Nunga that these plan platforms are indeed relevant because they offer us um, as stakeholders to uh, share information and also address questions. I also want to use this platform to um, uh, uh, invite those that are interested in uh, scholarship opportunities around the skills that I've mentioned that we will, as of next month, next month, where am I? Am I already in July? Sometime in July, we will start promoting the scholarships that we are going to offer next year. So I encourage you to uh, visit our website, I encourage you to um, read the press so that you uh, find out what scholarships we plan to roll out next year, and you are very welcome to apply. Now, I also want to comment on the fact that um, these scholarships that we offer, they are for all Namibians, everybody, all Namibians. We appreciate that um, resources can be um, found in one part of the country, but there are resources for Namibians. When I eat fish that come from offshore, I don't ask myself should I eat it or not, because it comes from offshore Namibia, right? When I am um, enjoying resources that are coming from uh, taxation out of the uh, diamond industry, I don't ask where it comes from. I enjoy it as an Namibian. So I encourage all of you to uh, uh, invite all those Namibians that are interested in the oil and gas industry to apply for the scholarships. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, once again, it cannot be overemphasized that such engagements are important so that people can understand uh, what the industry is about. We saw it as a company in Kavango, where we started, there was a lot of resistance. And now I can tell you that we are in agreement with most things with the farmers and all our other stakeholders there. It's a question of education, and it's very important that we do it. Uh, so, uh, I can simply say that oil and gas can exist with farming, with fishing, and in other industries. Thank you. I would just like to say that I'm very impressed with this evening. I'd really like to congratulate NAS to setting up this forum. Uh, the turnout tonight obviously shows the need for the thirst for engagement and dialogue. Um, I think it's going to be an exciting series that we're going to have over the coming year, and I really appreciate the opportunity to participate. Um, I, I just want to finish off by saying um, things do happen only when people make them happen. Nothing happened by itself. Uh, and I am quite encouraged at least, you know, you know, the young people who are interested as to what, what's going on with our economy. Uh, because sometimes the impressions always create that now all the young people are not interested, they are only on social media doing all sorts of other stuff, but actually there are people who are interested in terms of where are we going. But as I say, things are only going to change if we make them ch you know, to change. 
Uh, and I would also want to encourage all of us to always think that the glass is half full and not always half empty. Because if you really think that the glass somehow, yes, there are problems, you know, there, and we are asking all these questions because we want to have solutions. And I hope that's all what we all want. You know, I'm asking a question because I really don't understand, and if, if, if you really explain to me, i also be in a position to make a better contribution to what needs to be done because now I do understand. And therefore, I will want to encourage you to continue to ask those questions. There should not be a question that is too difficult to ask or too sensitive to ask. Ask the questions. And those who have to answer the question need to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. If I don't have the answer today, I should also be able to say, I don't know the answer. I'll go and find out what the answer is. Uh, but I really just want to say it, it, was, it was great that we started this conversation. It's a new sector we have got, and as a ministry also, we have started also going to the region to start also to explain to the people what it is, what it could mean, and also to, evolve, to um, avail that opportunity for people to really ask, to start asking those questions um, and as an information, as a learning experience. And as I said, we are all going through that as a first time. But really, let's continue to ask the questions and also thinking that the glass is half full and not half empty. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Bridget, uh, Mr. Mwanachilenga, Ms. Mulemi, Mr. Mulunga. I think I am not a geologist, I am not a petroleum engineer, I'm not a minister of mines and energy. But as a Namibian citizen, I can say that Namibia will be built one conversation at a time. And with the oil and gas industry, these are some of the conversations that we make sure that Namibia will be built by. As we end off, I'd like to ask the director of the Alumni and NAS Foundation, Mr. Kaitira Kanji, to please give us a vote of things. Mr. Kanji? Uh, thank you very much. Um, mine is a very brief um, um, remarks, is to give a word of thanks. And as you say that, I really consider this as a privilege and honor to have the opportunity to express our gratitude and to thank all of you who made this event a success. I was very impressed, I was very surprised that we could get so many people. And I want to thank in particular the Honorable Minister of Mass and Energy, Honorable Tom Aluenda, who is always available. I know him even when he was governor of the Bank of Olympia. He was always available and he's always continued to be available for all of us. So thank you very much. I also want to, th to thank all members who are here, both ministers, members of parliament, members of the Dip diplomatic corps, our captain of industries, our speakers, our CEOs of companies who made time to be here with us, and also the, the members of the general public um, uh, to be part of this important event or important conversation. I'm so much encouraged by your questions, by your participations, that we actually, in actual fact, we plan to have um, a series of public lectures on a number of topics. One of the topics is to deal with issues of skills, where we're going to invite the universities to come and also be part of the panel here and discuss their richness and what they're doing for the industry. We're going to look at the issues of infrastructure. People ask the question of how do we transport the oil from Kavango, where, where it is, to the port. So we'll look at the infrastructure, look at the logistics. We're going to look at the environments. We're going to look at community participations, and I'm, I'm very happy that there are people from Kavango who are here, and I want to give you a business card so that when you do some of these series, you participate in your panel here. And we also want to go to the regions, and I already spoke uh, to my colleague here that we should not only have the publishers in Venduk, but also go take it where the people are, so that everybody can be educated. Because for us to educate, raise awareness about what is happening, because it's a new sector that is so much... Um, a potential for all of us. I also want to, of course, thank our speakers, our panelists, who shared valuable information about the oil and gas sector, and also the development and the benefits that will be coming to all of us, the country and the people. 
Um, my profound thanks also go to the exhibitors, the companies who are exhibiting the outside. Um, for their contribution, they brace the court to come and showcase what they have and what they can do for all of us. And just to mention some of them, is Puma Energy, Namcor, FNB First Round, Naimbia Green Energy Research uh, Institute, uh, Naimbia Investment uh, Board, Nampoa, Petrofund, and Namport. And furthermore, our special appreciation and profound gratitude to Recon Africa and Nampoa for the role they played in conceptualizing and also help us um, host this event. But also for their financial support. They also gave us uh, financial support to make this event a reality. So I want to thank you for your generous support and for making success out of the, our event. And lastly, I want to thank my staff. I don't have a lot of staff. I have only two staff members. But through their dedication, efforts, and time they've put in, a lot of time to organize this event, they really made us proud, and they make the event successful. In conclusion, I will, I will, I will let I leave you with two profound wisdoms uh, from Mark Twain and Major Agelo, and it's about giving. It's a, because you see, as we're here, we want everybody to participate and to give. And the first thing is kindness, and say that kindness is a language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Because if you are kind, you know, the people can feel you. And I think we should be kind to each other. The last one is when you give with a good heart, when you give cheerfully and accept gratefully what you are given. Because the economy, the oil and gas is given to us, but we must be able to receive it. Once we give with a good heart, we'll be blessed. And it's not going to be a curse, but it will be a blessing to all of us. I thank you. On that note, panelists, thank you very much. You can retire. For each and every person who has made time to be here, for the hours spent here, questions asked, please know that this is not the last session. It will be a monthly session. Please let us see you back here again. Thank you for your valuable contributions. Good night. There will be a few refreshments outside. Outside. <laughs> there will be some refreshment outside. Yeah.